All right, hello everyone. Hopefully all the audio and video is good. I'm actually trying to stream at 4K for the first time. So I was trying to uh, set up so recording was at 4K and then the actual streaming was at 1080, but that would have required two different encoding streams, which was just a little too much. So uh, we're just gonna actually stream at 4K and hopefully as long as I use a font that's big enough, you should be able to downscale it to 720 or 1080 or whatever, uh, and it should be readable. So, i uh, got to set the title because it's very old at this point. So, uh, let's see. I don't know what a good title is for this. Ah, is the font a little too small? I can up the font quite a bit. Just give me a heads up if the font is ever too small and I will try to change it. I think as long as I can fit uh, 80 column lines, I will be happy with that. So that was 24, I think. Uh, ch -ch -ch -ch. Yep, 24 point. And we'll change this here as well. And save that as default. All right, so hopefully this will be a little bit better. Okay. So I think I have that set up. It looks like on my end, when I rescale this to like a small window on a 1080p thing, it looks uh, pretty readable. So hopefully that will be the case and it looks pretty sharp. So the quality looks good. Uh, I'm just gonna spam that I'm live in a few channels and see if a couple people join and then we'll continue on. Cool. So, first thing I'm going to do is go through like a little bit of a schedule. And when I say schedule, I don't mean I actually have a schedule planned. We're not going to follow it. I'm just going to talk about the things that I would like to get to if we have time. So, I'm going to also change the font of this as well. So, uh, the very first thing I want to do is see if uh, I'll probably go through. Uh, the Xeon Phi's, which is what I'm going to be developing on today, so uh, a little bit about them, like microarchitecturally, and why they're fast and why they're slow and bottlenecks in certain places. Uh, then I want to uh, actually start getting into the meat of things. So let's see, Xeon Phi's uh, arc texture, and then we'll go into uh, calculating. That's part of up here. So we want to calculate the theoretical performance that we could get out of these based on uh, different documentation about the architecture, like how many uh, fused multiply adds you can do per cycle and so on and so forth. Um, then I want to go into actually doing some implementation. So uh, calculate uh, in practice performance so that's going to be like on a very simple task so we're going to do like a hot loop of fuse multiply adds of 32-bit floats and see how fast we can actually get that operation um, and see if we can get it close to the theoretical performance line uh, and then we'll finally move on to um, probably a convolutional layer uh, so actually implement a convolution I've been working on one uh, recently Mind the line wrapping isn't too great here. We'll fix that as we as we go. Uh, but it is an unrolled uh, ABX 512 implementation of a convolutional layer uh, with some specialties in that it like requires that the width is divisible by four because I do unrolling. Uh, but that's something that we can change as we go on. We can make it a little bit more 
adaptive and have multiple versions. So it will, uh, once it finds an image that isn't, uh, uh, a, what am I going for here? It's not uh, a factor of four for a width, uh, then we could drop down to like a one variant or like a non-unruled variant. So, sorry, I'm just getting in the mood here, so I'm making a lot of typos and mistakes, but that's fine. Uh, then once we get that done, I'm going to want to look into doing a fully connected layer. And once we have those core building blocks, we're probably going to build uh, a small neural network. Uh, and in this case, I'm always talking about convolutional ones. Make a small convolutional neural network. Uh, and this is not going to have backpropagation because that will be another algorithm we'll have to implement. I don't know if we'll get to that yet. I don't fully understand them yet. So a big caveat to this whole thing is I've been working on neural nets for like a week now. So my terminology is probably going to be wrong. I'm going to make a lot of mistakes, but it's more about uh, kind of discovering what is actually possible here. Um, and then... Uh, We'll just have this do like one of the very simple test cases. We could look at the MNIST database, I think it is what it's called. Uh, yeah, there's a handwritten digit database uh, that's very common for neural nets. And we can go through these and use these images and see if we can classify uh, very simple digits. Uh, and. So let's see, digit uh, autoencoder and uh, CNN. And then finally, uh, the whole point of a lot of this stuff is I've been trying to upgrade my World of Warcraft fishing bot. And to do this, basically, I need to be able to find the bobber on the screen. Um, and I have an old fishing bot that I wrote four or five years ago that still works to this day, but it relies on having uh, a stream of images so that you can subtract them and look for what is actually moving in the image. So I wanted to make it a little bit more of a challenge on myself by trying to, from a single screenshot, detect where the bobber is. And uh, if you're not familiar with the World of Warcraft, I have some samples of what a bobber looks like. Um, so I have a corpus of... Uh, looks like a little over a thousand, fifteen hundred. Uh, oh, that's bobber lists. The actual bobbers. I've got twelve hundred images of bobbers, and these are two fifty six by two fifty six. And once GIMP loads, oh, I haven't loaded GIMP on this account. I made a new account for the stream, so I might run into things where I don't have things set up correctly. But uh, this will just take a a little bit. But. Um, so, I don't know too much about neural nets. I found uh, one website was really helpful. It was a JavaScript implementation of a uh, kind of like a neural net framework. Uh, and we're going to look at that first just to kind of show everyone what I will be looking at doing uh, throughout the stream, but just making it faster. So we're not looking to completely solve any problems. Uh, so this is what a bobber looks like. Um, Let's see, I like the single window mode in GIMP. It's what I'm used to in other editors. But basically, it's got like these two feathers, one blue, one red, or brown. I'm colorblind, so you'll probably notice I got a lot of colors wrong throughout this whole video. Um, and then you have like this silver hook bit, which has some very sharp angles, both on the outside and on the inside, which should be some recognizable feature. And then the like green or tan or whatever color this thing is as the actual base of the bobber. Uh, and basically, the goal is to go throughout the whole screen and identify this bobber so that we're able to click on it. So every time you fish, uh, the bobber shows up in a random location, uh, probably pseudo-random location on the screen. And basically, I need to be able to find where it is so I can click on it. Further, I have a tough problem that I need to uh, have a good enough difference between detected bobber and non-detected bobber so that on screens where there is no bobber present, I want it to tell me that there is no bobber. So um, this is kind of an artificial problem. I'm just coming up with things that I want to do to learn neural nets. So we're going to look at this convolutional net JS implementation. They have a bunch of demos. Uh, I don't know too much about it. I don't know if it's from Stanford, but most of the things uh, come from Stanford. So 
They have a bunch of different demos here that use their little JavaScript implementation, uh, the MNIST or MNIST, or I don't know if there's a shortened way of saying that. There's a little convolutional neural net for classifying digits. Uh, one that's classifying like 2D data and trying to find a way to fit all of the points in different classification areas. Um, and then this MNIST digit autoencoder. And these are the three that I'm particularly interested in. So if we were to look at the convolutional neural net uh, for classifying the digits, um, it's actually pretty simple. So you have a loss that's showing the, gra uh, the loss over time, which should reduce. Um, we have the training accuracy, which is how accurate it is on the training set, and the validation accuracy, which I would expect to be the correctness over the test set, but there's a different test set predictions uh, thing. So I'm not entirely sure how that lines up, but that's just an interface thing. So this is a really simple neural net. It has uh, 24 by 24 by 1 for the input, which is just grayscale uh, 24 by 24 pixel image. That goes into a convolutional layer that has, uh, let's see, eight output filters, and uh, it looks like a size of five. So it's a five by five kernel. Um, and you can see on this website, they show all of the intermediate steps, which is actually really cool. And this is being trained in my browser, uh, which is pretty fascinating. So we see the activations and the gradients being applied. Uh, we're I don't think the gradients are applied. I think that's the uh, error checking stuff. I, I could be wrong. Once again, terminology is going to be bad. Uh, then it's a couple other. We've got a ReLU, so a uh, uh, it's like uh, it's a linear rectifier, right? It's basically you take any of the negative values and turn them into zero. And this makes the, uh, it makes the slope of the line, so the, um, man, I am really blanking on words. It makes the differential equation have a non-zero output, which allows for, like, the back propagation stuff, uh, which I'm not too familiar with yet, but that's okay. We'll learn that probably throughout this video. Uh, then we have a pooling layer, which is typically max pooling. So they're going to go in like two by two pixel locations on the inputs. And it's going to find the maximum intensity of each of those four pixels and output one pixel, which is the maximum intensity. So it allows for some uh, rotational properties of the image to not have an effect on uh, the network. So basically by trimming it down, by reducing the size, but only taking the maximums, hopefully you end up uh, getting rid of some of the noise of rotations and uh, scaling. Uh, then another convolutional layer, and uh, another RELU, a linear, I, I don't know what a, rectified linear unit is how I'm gonna say it. Um, and then a pooling layer again, and then a fully connected layer, which is typically the end. That's one thing that we'll be implementing today. And then finally, uh, a soft max, which I should know what a soft max is, is, but I don't. But we can see on the, this is not the data that it's training on, so it shouldn't be overfitting on this because it's obviously not being trained on. But we can see it's detecting this is a five, this is a seven, this is a two, this is a two, so on and so forth, with surprisingly good accuracy for a very short amount of training time in a browser in JavaScript on a single core. Um, so, the other ones that we're interested in are this uh, classification of 2D data. You can see it like finds a grouping around all the green dots that excludes all the red dots. Uh, and with random data, we'll see that it will struggle a little bit more, or the spiral data, which is shapely. Uh, it's trying to find a way to fit all of these dots in this layer, um, or in this shape, but it's struggling to do that. However, by changing the number of neurons uh, of each of the fully connected layers, we might get it to actually take shape, albeit it'll be a lot slower. And there we saw it actually was able to find a grouping that included all the green, but not all the reds, except for maybe a couple on the very center. So this is a really simple uh, uh, network. This is not a convolutional network. It's just two fully connected layers. 
So that's something we could do pretty early. And then finally, there's an auto encoder, which is something that I've really found to be quite interesting. Um, that is, did I click on the wrong one? Okay, yeah, I did. So the auto encoder is basically a bunch of fully connected layers that are forced down into a small uh, fully connected layer in the center and then it's expanded out. So the goal of a, uh, an auto encoder is basically to make a a function that can predict, uh, it can make a new output that is supposed to match the input. So we have like the input activations here, and then what it thinks, uh, what it reconstructs that to be. And the error is the difference between the two, and you do back propagation through the network. So it looks like this is just random noise. So this is looking at the center layer, which is has two different components. And we're looking at the X component here, or Y component here, and the X component here. And we're basically trying to see if things get grouped. Um, and this is something that we'll probably let run in the background for a little bit of time, because it takes a little bit of time to have some meaning. But it's interesting, because uh, unlike convolutional neural nets, which are supervised, meaning you're giving them training data, which is telling it uh, the expected output that, that you want, um, this is actually unsupervised learning, where it's just taking this set itself and it's trying to find classifications of uh, different things. Um, and what those things are, you don't really know. I mean, you can try and look at it and see what it's trying to figure out. But by forcing it to go through this very th uh, uh, narrow layer in the center, you're forcing it to come up with some representation where these two uh, pixels somehow contain enough information that it can reconstruct an image. So what you'll see is over time, you're going to start getting groupings of similar shapes. So we can see zeros are kind of forming over here in one cluster. The ones kind of form over here. And that's mainly because those are like the strongest uh, differences. But as this runs more and more, these groups get a little bit more and more clustered. And other things start showing uh, in their own areas as well. So we have like fours kind of up here, eights kind of in this area. Some eights are going to be in the zeros because they can look pretty similar at times uh, and so on and so forth. But these are really cool because they're really simple. It's just a bunch of fully connected layers. Um, and there's a bunch you can read about on Wikipedia on autoencoders. Um, and kind of here's a an image of what it looks like from a macro scale. You have a bunch of inputs, a smaller fully connected layer, an even smaller uh, like middle layer, and then it goes, uh, so that's the encoder where it's encoding these two center neurons, and then it tries to decode it to reconstruct the output, or X prime in this case. Um, so uh, there are some uh, negative problems with this. As uh, Wikipedia says, I don't quite understand all the negatives and all the ways around them yet, but that's not a big deal. That's something we can figure out uh, as we go on or further on in life because uh, this stuff is kind of well beyond my mathematical background, which is like Calc BC in high school and then five years of not doing it, so I've forgotten almost all of it. So... Um, there are some cool things you can do with autoencoders to try to make them a little bit more robust by doing pre-training. I don't really understand the operations that go into that pre-training yet, but maybe as time goes on, that's something we'll look at. So, um, so we're going to let this run in the background, and then we're just going to hop into the Xeon Phi's for a minute. So, uh, this box that I'm SSH'd into on both the left and right is where we're going to be doing most of the work today. Uh, and the reason for this is that it's a very special box. It's a Xeon Phi, and it is, uh, we're going to look at CPU info. It is a 64 thread, or 64 core, 256 thread machine. Um, so it's got four threads per core, and that's traditional Intel hyper-threading, but it's unlike normal Xeons where it's normally uh, two threads per core, it's four. Um, so we'll see that they're... Uh, I've specifically got the Xeon Phi 7210, which is the cheapest model that you can possibly get. Um, it's clocked at 1.3 gigahertz. I'm guessing it's down clocked right now due to some power saving. Um, but it supports many different things. Specifically, it has AVX 512F, uh, AVX 512RM, and it's got uh, two other AVX 512 things as well, which I'm kind of surprised they're not mentioned here. So, uh, 
what is the point of the Fi's? Well, the Fi's are more uh, similar to like a GPU, where a GPU traditionally is going to do bulk operations. So these are heavily vectorized um, uh, systems. So basically, AVX 512 means they're 512 bit. Uh, they're 512 bit vectors. So what we have here is, I can barely even see my cursor and paint. So we've got, uh, since this is going to be a 512 bit register, we're able to fit uh, 16 different floats in here. Uh, that's eight. So we could do eight doubles or quad words. And ultimately we end up with this terrible drawing showing that you can get uh, 16 different 32-bit uh, values in here. So this means that I can do bulk operations um, on 16 things at a time. So if we look at, and I'm kind of expecting that people are familiar with uh, vectorized stuff. I'm not going to go too much into the base concepts unless people really want that, in which case I can try and explain it more. So Egner Fogg has really good uh, information on software optimization and a very terrible website, which I really like. Um, so explicitly, he publishes these uh, instructional latency tables. So we're going to go ahead and take a look at these. Um, and this will kind of go through the latencies and the reciprocal throughputs of each instruction. So first, we're going to look at Knight's Landing. This is the second generation Xeon Phi's, which happens to be what we're getting. These are actual processors, meaning that I'm booting and running Linux on them. They're not the coprocessors that traditionally uh, the previous Xeon Phi's, which were like the little graphics card looking things. Uh, those were uh, Knight's Corner. And next, I think, is Knight's, uh, Knight's Landing. I think that's not what I want. Uh, the next one is, what is it? What is it? It's night something. Um, there's a new supercomputer that is, yeah, Argon is making a uh, new supercomputer using the third generation Xeon Phi's, which are, I think Knight's Fairy is the early one, whatever. So we're going to look at specifically the fused multiply add instruction. And the reason the fused multiply add is very interesting is it should be the fastest instruction on the architecture. And fused multiply add is really simple. You basically have an output uh, that takes, uh, let's say this is x, and we get to take two inputs and we get to add a third. Well, it takes three inputs. We get to multiply two inputs and add a third input and then have an output. Uh, this is really convenient when we're doing convolutions, as we're very often doing this operation uh, because we're summing up all of the uh, multiple, all of the matrix matrix multiplications, and we'll kind of look in that uh, once we get into the assembly. But this is supposed to be the fastest operation on the Xeon Phi. So, if we're looking at this architecture, we're going to look down for uh, FM add for Knight's Landing. And what this is saying, uh, if I look at the actual columns, this is the latency column and the reciprocal throughput column. And it does this for almost all the instructions on the architecture. So here we can see the vectored uh, fused multiply add instruction. And explicitly, it says all of the fused multiply adds. Um, and we can see that it has uh, six cycle latency. So the time from uh, the time it takes for the processor to like start actually executing this once it's shown up in the, I don't know a good way of saying this, like shown up in the decoder, it will take six cycles. However, if you're doing many independent fuse multiply adds, it has a reciprocal throughput of 0.5, uh, meaning that you can do, if you take the reciprocal of the reciprocal throughput, you just get the throughput, which is two, meaning that for each cycle, you're able to do two fuse multiply adds. And each fuse multiply add is uh, 16 32-bit uh, floats. So we can actually start looking at the computation of the theoretical maximum performance of the Xeon Phi. So first of all, we know that its clock rate is uh, 1.3 gigahertz. 
Um, then further, we know that we can execute uh, two uh, fuse multiply adds uh, per cycle. Uh, we'll do two here. And then further, each fuse multiply add is two flops because it's doing a multiply and add floating point operation. Further than that, we have, uh, uh, let's see, 16 floats per vector. There, floats per vector. So we're kind of coming up with all the different components. And then finally, we have number of cores, which is 64. Number of cures, yes. So if we were to actually do this math, uh, we will see that 1.3 times 2 times 2 times 16 times 64 is how many gigaflops uh, we expect. So it comes out to 5.32 uh, teraflops, uh, theoretical, 32-bit, uh, uh, so single precision float performance, uh, which is pretty fast. So further, there, I saw some information that uh, AVX, uh, let's do Xeon Phi AVX, uh, uh, what is it, not clock rate, yeah, clock rate. So I've heard, but I haven't confirmed that the clock rate actually runs, oh, it looks like uh, Wikipedia actually has it. So they mention that uh, 200 megahertz. So they can boost their uh, peak speeds when running one or two cores. Um, from three to the maximum, it can boost 100 megahertz above the base frequency. All chips run AVX code at a reduced minus 200 megahertz frequency, reducing the peak compute performance. So I don't know if this means that uh, when I'm running all cores, I'll get a boost of 100 megahertz and then I'll subtract down 200, so I'll net be down 100 megahertz, or if it's just always down 200. So we'll just go with always down 200 for uh, just to be on err on the side of slowness. And now we're just going to do the exact same mathematical operation: two times two times 16 times 64, and this will give a 4.50 teraflops of the uh, SP AVX float performance. Uh, performance. So, why is this number interesting to us? Uh, well, this number is interesting because when we're going through, we can easily compute the number of floating point operations that we actually did when, say, we're doing a convolutional layer. Um, and we know that this is the theoretical maximum performance that the architecture could deliver if, like, everything is in sync. The pipeline is happy, the instruction decode is happy, every little thing about the microarchitecture is working together. So if we were able to get exactly at 4.5 teraflops, we would know there's no reason to do any more optimization because at that point we're, we're done. We can't physically get any faster than this number. However, if we see that we have 10% of theoretical efficiency, uh, we could probably start to figure out, hey, maybe we're doing something wrong here and we should be able to get a lot faster. Um, so, I implemented a uh, convolutional layer in AVX 5.12. I'm just trying to make this stuff fit on one screen with here, sorry. Um, and basically, I have two implementations of a convolutional layer. And these implementations, one is traditionally written, uh, just a standard implementation that is written in Rust. Uh, and then, let's see, these things are kind of hard to fit on one line. So I have a traditional implementation written in Rust. All of these are relying on doing 16 convolutions. So basically we're looking at uh, uh, a single layer in of arbitrary size. So we're going to make a little comment. We're looking for something where we have uh, width times height uh, times one layer in that is going to be put in input data and then we're going to uh, do a convolution of that against uh, 
uh, 16 3 by 3 kernel, so 3 by 3 by 16. And that's how we're going to denote the convolution with that uh, kernel size. And as an output, we'll get width times height times 16 output layers, which is going to go in this output data. You can see here we do a bunch of assertions. We make sure that the width and height of the input are at least 3, because that's the size of our kernel. Uh, we're going to make sure that the output width and height are uh, equal to the input data width minus 2 and the output data input data height minus 2. The reason for this is we're going to lose uh, 2 pixels on the edge of the screen when we do the convolution. Uh, in some implementations, they will just pad the input image so that you don't actually lose uh, any width. Um, but in this case, I'm okay with the reduction, so we're going to go with that. Um, this might be a problem in the future, as this reduction could change the, um, the factors of the width of the image, which could have a negative effect on the unrolling that we do by hand. Um, we make sure that the input data is only one vector, that's the times one here. Then we also make sure that the output uh, vector size is 16, which is this constant, which is what we expect here. The kernel is hard-coded to be a fixed size thing already, so we don't have to do any assertions on there. It's always going to be 16 by 3 by 3. Uh, then we also assert that the, so we have this little component structure, which has a box, uh, a boxed slice in Rust, which is basically an arbitrarily sized array uh, that doesn't change in size, uh, that's stored on the heap, and then a width and a height that we uh, give to this data, and then a vector, which is the number of vectored components uh, in that data. Um, so in this case, the... Um, the width and height can be whatever you want. Like, you can just change those. So these assertions here are just making sure that the actual input data size matches up with the... Um, the actual slice in this box matches up with the length that you specify uh, based on the width, height, and vector. So it's just making sure it's a sanity check. Uh, this code is not written to be, like, secure or anything. Since it's in Rust, it should be. Um, but we're mainly writing these assertions uh, so that we don't make mistakes ourselves. So then the convolution is actually really simple. We're going to go through each uh, uh, height. So we're going to, for each y in 0 through height minus 2, and that minus 2 is safe because of this assertion. Same with the width minus 2. And then we'll go through each x. So basically, we're going to go through every single pixel on the image. We're going to initialize this uh, sum vector, which is going to receive the actual convolutional output. Uh, this is vector size because we're doing a vectored operation here. Uh, I mean, technically we're not, but you'll see that Rust actually will emit uh, vectored operations, or LLVM in this case, which is what Rust uses as a backend. Um, and then we're going to go through each y and x in the kernel, which is that 3x3 three three kernel that we got. Um, and then further, for each kernel, we're going to go through each vector, and we're going to compute this sum. So we're going to take the sum for this vector, we're going to multiply it, uh, we're going to grab this input data, we're going to multiply it by the kernel at that position. So we kind of, since we store it as a one-dimensional array, we're doing uh, explicit two-dimensional array indexing. So we've got the y times the 3, which is the height, times the vector size, because all of the um, kernel uh, like scalars are next to each other in terms of the vectors, so we need to skip over all those. And then kx times the vector size plus the actual uh, vector id. So this is going to go through and compute 16 convolutions at a time for an input image. And the reason why we do 16 at a time is because this can be reused. This is not affected by a uh, vector, so basically we'll ultimately read this once, and then we'll do 16 operations on this, and then we'll actually compute the sum of that. So it has a lot more uh, cache friendliness and data reuse friendliness. And then finally, we're going to copy the output sums that we've accumulated uh, back into the output data, which is the output payload. Um, so we're also marking these as inline never, which will make Rust emit these as kind of standalone functions. Um, and that just makes it easier for us to kind of look at the assembly as time goes on. So we can see the performance data on this. Obviously, it depends on the size of the input. Uh, so a single thread was 7,000 convolutions per second. 
uh, with 256 by 256 uh, all the way up to 613,000 per second with 256 threads. Um, then once we went to a 32 by 32 input, which is a little bit more reasonable for uh, a hidden layer in the network, you know, maybe your first layer in the network will deal with a large input image, but you'll normally, normally reduce it down pretty quickly. And in this case, it's uh, 500,000 single thread and 43 million uh, with 256 threads, uh, which is pretty good. Um, however, um, we can actually talk about the performance that we're getting here. So this uh, 42.7 convolutions per second already includes the 16 vectors that we're doing at a time, so we don't want to multiply by that again. So for a 32 by 32 input, we're actually going to iterate uh, uh, specifically, let's see, uh, 30 by 30 times in these outer loops because we subtract two. So 30, 30, three, and three. And we can ignore this inner, uh, this loop because we've already factored that into this 42.7. So we can multiply this by 30 times 30 times uh, three times three. And that's giving us the number of uh, fused multiply adds that were, in this case, uh, Rust is not actually emitting fused multiply adds, but we have a multiply and an add here. So we have two floating point operations for this. So basically for each width and each height, we do three by three operations and each operation has two floating point operations. So this will give us the mega flops of uh, this algorithm. So we'll just throw this up in a calculator and we'll see that we are at, uh, let's see, this is uh, 691 gigaflops. So 691.740 gigaflops. And as you saw before, we were expecting 4.5 teraflops, so 4,500 uh, gigaflops, meaning that the efficiency of this algorithm is, uh, we can do 691 divided by 4,500, and this is about 15% efficient. So we are, for a very naive implementation, this is actually pretty good efficiency. Um, however, we've implemented a um, vectorized implementation that's explicitly written in assembly, uh, and we'll kind of go through that as time goes on. Uh, I think these numbers might be a little bit outdated. So at one point it was 2,800 gigaflops, but uh, we'll rerun this. So first I have to set up the Rust flags to expect that we are um, targeting the Knight's Landing architecture. Um, more specifically, LLVM is who handles that. Otherwise this code won't build because uh, it'll see that these instructions are not allowed in uh, the standard default architecture, which is, uh, I think, like, core 2 is probably the standard output. So, this is currently running on a single core. So, up here, we have a bunch of parameters that we're going to be tuning as we do uh, performance things. Actually, in the, in this case, 64 threads is actually ideal. So, one thread per core versus four threads per core. Um, we've got a, so, this is kind of our worker thread. So, we're going to spin up uh, number of threads of these. We're going to set affinity to a specific core on the machine. Uh, in terms of Linux, it organizes it where 0 through 63 or 1 through 64. So the first 64 cores are actually uh, separate physical cores. And then after that, you start bringing on threads. So if you were to go through and set your affinities for 0 to 64, you would know that you would get set to an actual physical core uh, and you wouldn't be setting multiple threads on the same core. Then we kind of set up these structures, which is a little bit ugly. Um, we set up our input data, which is test width times test height. Uh, once again, we specify the width, width and height here because we don't know the actual size of this uh, vector because it's a, a 2D array in a 1D array. Um, then we have the kernel, which is vector size times 3 times 3, which we're going to be using for the convolution. We're going to have the, uh, for the outputs, we're going to have the vector size, because we have 16 outputs uh, of test width minus 2 times test width, or test height minus 2. As we saw, we'll have a 2 uh, pixel reduction on both the width and height once we do the convolution. 
And this is identical to out. So we have out and out too. Then we're going to go through uh, all of the input data and we're going to give it a random value. So in Rust, uh, random's a templated function. In this case, on the left side, it knows that this is a float, so I don't need to explicitly tell it to generate a float. That would be the syntax to explicitly tell it. Uh, and in the case of Rust, it generates a random value between 0 and 1, uh, where 0 is inclusive, but 1 is not. Then we go through again, and we generate random values for all of the kernels. Um, so there's no reason for this. This is just to give some random data for testing. Then we do a convolutional, uh, a convolution test. That is our Rust implementation of the convolution, um, data kern and the out. And then we do convolution and assembly, which is our handwritten thing uh, with data kernel and out too. Um, and since we do an explicit fuse multiply add in the inline assembly, uh, there actually is a little bit of difference in the output. So we cannot do a direct floating point comparison. We do a fuzzy comparison. So basically, we take the output data of uh, the Rust implementation. We iterate through all of that. We zip it up with an iterator of all of the um, uh, output two data, so our assembly implementation, meaning we basically go through them uh, together. Then we're going to compute the difference between the two and take the absolute value. And then we're going to make sure that the difference is never larger than 0. 0.00001. Basically, make sure that they both have the same outputs. So this is just to have a known good implementation of a convolution, or at least I'm comparing, or I'm matching one that's already incorrectly written, but I'm pretty sure it's correct. Um, and it will panic if this fails, but it'll also print out some debug information, which will tell us where it failed, which might uh, cue us in as to what we did as a mistake. Um, then we're going to manually implement a barrier, and the reason we do it manually is though it's a hot barrier instead of a like OS level barrier. Um, the goal of this is just that all of the cores start processing at the same time, and then uh, we wait until one is left. So basically. Uh, this barrier starts out at zero. It's shared between all the threads. When a thread comes online, it uh, adds one to this barrier. And then all of them wait until all of the threads are online. Then we uh, perform the convolutions. We first save off the timestamp counter. Then we go through all of the tests. And then finally, we um, save off the... Uh, then once we are done with that, actually I didn't want that on the line, so we do all of the operations, and then we subtract one, so we're doing an add of not zero, so all Fs, so subtract one from the barrier, and then the final person, so the, uh, the last thing to complete will actually be the one who reports on the statistics. So we do some pretty nasty things here, uh, so we get the elapsed amount of time in cycles, uh, which is a very precise number because it comes from the timestamp counter in hardware. And then we get the elapsed number of seconds here. And we do this by uh, dividing the number of cycles by uh, 1.3 gigahertz. Um, and with the... Uh, this is a little bit nasty because this wouldn't be portable to other things, but since we're working on one very specific piece of hardware, this will give us an extremely accurate uh, representation of seconds. Um, so as we saw earlier, AVX gets downclocked by 200 megahertz. However, the timestamp counter has to be uh, always running at the same speed on um, regardless of the performance mode. So this is actually safe to do to get the num uh, number of seconds. Then we uh, compute the number of convolutions we did, which is the uh, number of tests, which is the number of times we did this loop, the number of threads, how many threads actually did the processing, the vector size, uh, and this tells us how many convolutions we did. And then we can calculate how many floating point operations we did by taking convolutions, the number of convolutions we did, times the output width, times the output height, times that 9.0, which is the 3 times 3, and then finally by 2.0, which is the number of floating point operations per internal uh, thing. So we will uh, we'll clean up this line a bit and get it to fit in one line. Or one 80 character column. We'll do that here as well. Just keeping this a little cleaner. 
Um, this red line down the side is the 80 character column, which in Rust is actually kind of hard to stay under because some of the lines get pretty long, as you can see up here. So this is going to let us run this program and have it very quickly tell us the actual performance that we're getting. So we're going to run this through quick. Um, the compile time is pretty long, but... So, as we can see here, uh, it, we did a test. Uh, how many tests did we actually have set up here? We had uh, a million tests. So we did a million... Um, Convol or we did a million of these convolution tests per core, uh, and then also, since there's 16 convolutions each, blah, 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 we did a bunch of convolutions. So this is telling us the number of convolutions we're doing per second, and then the final number is telling us the gigaflops. So the gigaflops is kind of a normalized, oper uh, normalized uh, indicator of the performance regardless of the input size. So in this case, I was using 66 by 10, so 64 uh, by 8 as the output of the convolution. Don't really know why I was doing this, but we can look at uh, we'll look at 34 by 34, which will have a 32 by 32 output, uh, and this should have little effect on the actual performance, um, simply because it's uh, it's all going to fit in cache. So on the Xeon Phi, there is, I think, 32K of dcache per core, and then there is one meg of L2 cache for every two cores. So two cores share, so eight threads, share uh, one meg of L2 cache, and then there is actually no L3 cache, but there is a high bandwidth memory. There's 16 gigs of on-chip um, high bandwidth memory which can be used as cache in this, and in this case, I actually have that set up in the BIOS in caching mode. You can also explicitly use it as its own memory in its own memory space, um, but I don't have that configuration set up. So you can see here in the 34 by 34, uh, we only got 161 million convolutions per second because each uh, input was much larger or probably twice as large. So it got slower, but we still have this normalized gigaflops value, which is telling us uh, how the performance is looking. And as we can see, they're pretty much on par with each other. So this is interesting because this is our um, convolutional implementation and uh, our theoretical maximum is 4,500. So we're already at about 66% efficiency on this implementation, uh, which is pretty damn good. Um, it means that we are, let's see, the 4,500 divided by 2 is 2,250. Um, that's assuming we did one fuse multiply add per cycle. Um, and since we are over that, we know that we are achieving a little bit more than one fuse multiply add per cycle, which has a really good indication that we're correctly unrolling things. Our dependency chains are uh, disconnected enough that the processor is able to do multiple operations uh, very easily together. So, the question is, why am I only at 66 or 67 percent theoretical performance? Uh, so one thing that we're doing, we're actually working on live data. So these uh, fuse multiply adds are actually taking in memory. And whenever you're dealing with memory and not registers, you might be hitting uh, more cycles and actually trying to get that memory delivered to you. So that could be a reason why we're lower. Um, it could be that we're not unrolling enough or we're unrolling too little. In this case, uh, we're unrolling eight times. So we're calculating eight convolutions at a time. So I guess I probably should go through this code a little bit before uh, I start talking about the internals. So as we went through the previous convolution, it's just a matrix multiplication of each 3x3 three three, uh, position in the input, and then that 3x3 three three multiplication is summed up and then stored as one output pixel in the output. So uh, we have the kernels provided here. We have the input data and output data that we're going to input and output, of course. Um, and then we have the uh, width of the input in bytes. Uh, we just use this as a... I think somewhere, I think in this, I think it's five. Uh, we'll take a look at that later. So then we have this inline assembly block. Uh, what we do is we preload all three by three kernels 
In AVX 512, you have 32 registers. And with 32 registers, we can, we can store a lot in there. So we should. We should take advantage of as much as we can of the register file. So in this case, uh, we have the 3x3 three three, uh, kernels. So we're going to preload all of the kernel values. So you saw that we had 3x3x16, three by three by but each one of these ZMMs are storing 16 at a time. Uh, and that's a full cache line, so you'll see this 40, 80 CO pattern a lot, because it's 0, 64, 128, uh, 192, 256, blah, blah, blah. So basically, we're going to load that entire kernel data structure that we passed in, the 3x3, three three, into registers. So those are going to stay in registers, they're not going to change, and that means we're never going to access that memory again. Uh, and we're doing this outside of the loop, so it really has no actual cost on the uh, performance of this algorithm, unless y and x, the width and height, were really small. Um, an EAX will keep track of uh, y, and an EBX will keep track of x. This will match up with this loop here, where we had y on the outside, and then x on the inside. And if we uh, skip over all of the actual computation, you'll see at the end, um, in this case, since we're doing eight, sorry, uh, in this case, we're doing eight operations at a time, so we're adding eight to the x value. We're comparing this with uh, three, zero, one, two, three, so the width. Uh, so while we are less than the width, while we're below the width, uh, we will continue in this inner loop, which is iterating all of the x's. And then once we're done with the row, we're going to add one to the y value. Uh, then we're going to compare that with the height of the image and then jump back to the y iterator. And then eventually, once we've gone through all x and y's, we drop through. Uh, in this case, uh, we have to move the convolutional pointer uh, forward. So the output data pointer, we move forward by two pixels. This will skip the two pixels on the end of each line that are trimmed off. So... Um, now we can look at the actual computation that's being performed in here. In this case, we initialize uh, eight different accumulators. Uh, we use, we're use we always going to use the V variant, which is the AVX variant. Uh, AVX 0 extends all the registers. So in this case, we're XORing the 128-bit XMMs with themselves to produce an output XMM of 0, which will set all of the top uh, bits of the ZMM, the 512-bit thing, to zero as well. So basically, zero out all of the values uh, in zero through seven. Keep in mind that we used uh, 10 through 18 for the kernel, so we can't reuse those. Then we're going to use the uh, vectored fused multiply add 231 PS instruction, which probably sounds like a complete nightmare, but it actually makes a lot of sense. So the V is vectored. FMA, uh, FM add, fuse multiply add. So it's a vectored fused multiply add instruction. So that's pretty descriptive. So what does this 231 mean? So this actually is telling you which uh, values are being multiplied and which values are being added. So the 231 is telling us that the second parameter and the third parameter are being multiplied and then they're being added to one and always the output goes to 1. So basically you'll see here we have the ZMM10, which is the very first pixel in the kernel. So we take, uh, we take the kernel, then we multiply it by the input data, and we'll talk about this notation a little bit later. Uh, and then we add it to our accumulator and then store it in the accumulator. So this is equivalent to, uh, if we were to write it, uh, it is ZMM0 plus equals, or we can just look at equals to, to make it a little bit more explicit. Uh, ZMM10 times this 1 plus 0, uh, so we'll just do 1, uh, plus ZMM0, which is the same as plus equals, which, as you'll notice, is identical to the operation that we actually have up here, the sum plus equals the input data times the kernel. Um, so it looks like a really disgusting operation, but it's actually pretty descriptive. And there's a different uh, instruction for each variant. So there's like a, a 3, 2, 1, 1, 3, 2, whatever all of the, uh, the non-1, um, 
You don't have every single permutation because some of the permutations have overlap, so I don't remember which ones are the explicit ones, but basically you can make it so you multiply zero and or one and zero and add three to it and so on and so forth. So it's a very um, it's a very uh, widely applicable instruction in that case. Uh, and then the PS at the end means packed uh, single precision. So it means that we're using a packed operation and not a scalar operation. A scalar op operation would mean that you'd only use the lowest order uh, word, or in this case float, um, for the operation. So we're doing a packed single precision operation because we're dealing with 32-bit uh, floats. Then we've got this weird syntax, which you've probably never seen curly braces in assembly before, which is kind of strange. But this 1 to 16 is one of the coolest things that uh, AVX 512 has to offer, and I think this will have to stick around forever as we go forward. It's, a, it's such a cool concept. And this 1 to 16 means that the memory located here is actually one value. It is one floating point value. So you're derefing 32 bits out of this memory, and then it will broadcast that, so 1 to 16, it'll broadcast that 32-bit value to all 16 places to create the 512-bit vector. And that's what you're actually doing the operation on. So it allows you to stream in data f four bytes at a time, um, but you're still doing fully wide vectored operators, uh, operations on it. So traditionally, you would need to do like a vectored, uh, like a broadcast, uh, I can't remember what the actual like SS or PS or whatever, some suffix to this, into a ZMM0 of, uh, let's say, 1. So this will be a D word. It will broadcast this floating point value into this register. And then you would go and do a VFM add 2 through 1 PS ZM0, ZM10. Uh, let's say this is ZMM99, which doesn't exist. Oops, I'm going to typo. Uh, ZMM99. So basically, this broadcast allows this to be done in one operation. And if we were to look back at Agner Fogg's table, uh, you'll see that... Uh, Let's just make sure that we are on Knight's Landing still. We are. Uh, that is a different thing. So vbroadcast ss uh, with a uh, output to a register and an input from a memory location. We see it has uh, 5 latency and a reciprocal throughput of 0.5. Meaning that if these were fused together somehow magically, which they're not going to be because they're different instructions, um, although with threading, some magic can happen if you have delays. Um, but basically, you have two uh, two different operations that you need to do to do this equivalent thing. So basically, this can be twice as fast. Um, and twice as fast when you're talking about a micro-architectural change is just insane. It is such a huge improvement. Um, so, what you'll see here is we're going to go through, for each x value, we're looking at the 0, 0 position on the kernel, which is stored in ZMM10. We're going to accumulate seven different positions because we're going to treat uh, these offsets as different 0, 0 uh, pixels. So, we're going, um, we're computing eight different, conv well, eight times 16 convolutions in a batch. And the reason this is nice is this gives the prefetcher uh, a lot to work with, as these are just sequential 4-byte accesses. And further, it means that there's no dependency between these instructions. So we're going to change this uh, in a minute to a non-unrolled thing, where we only have one accumulator, and we'll see how much of an impact that has on performance. Um, then you'll see here we're going to the next pixel, so we're accumulating the next pixel multiplied by the uh, one zero position in the kernel um, by one two three four five six seven eight and and then two through nine, and now we're getting to the next uh, row in the kernel. So to look at the next row, we have to add this five, and the five is the IDW, which is the input data width in pixels. So this basically means go to the next row in the image, take that pixel, perform this operation on it. 
So you'll see that we have nine different groupings here for each kernel, and then for each we have eight different convolutions. So we can see that this is uh, about 2.9 gigaflops, which is about that 66% performance. And uh, we're going to delete all of these uh, unrollings. So we're only going to do one at a time, which is uh, a little bit easier to work with, but you'll see the performance effect it has. So D6, D6, oops. Uh, I might have made a mistake. Uh, I want D5. No, D6. I know how to use Vim. Anyways. So now we have to change this. This was wrong. This was 8 pixels, but now we're going 1 pixel ahead. Uh, since we're only doing 1 at a time, we move by 1. We have to change this value to 1. Uh, we get rid of all of these. So this is storing the outputs of the different accumulators. We only have one accumulator now. So we're only looking at that. Uh, we move the result forward by 64. So we're taking in one pixel at a time from the input, uh, and we're so four bytes at a time. Uh, in this case, all of the pixels are floating point intensity values. Um, and we're not, RGB are not combined. They'll be completely separate that we'll perform different operations on. So we're only looking at one part of the color space in intensity. Then we're going to uh, add 64 to the output because we output 16 uh, different convolutions. Uh, and it's 64 because it's 16 times 4. Uh, then we're going to add 1 to our uh, increment. This will stay the same. This will all stay the same. We're not changing how many times we're going through. Um, so this has gotten a lot simpler. Now you'll see that we have nine different operations here for each of the uh, points in the kernel. So we should be able to run this. And keep in mind, this was the one that was unrolled eight times. And now we're looking at a non-unrolled one. And since we have that check in there, we'll get a panic if we made a mistake and maybe copy and pasted the wrong thing. Um, so we should see what an effect this had. So we can see it's been over six seconds and it hasn't completed yet. And ultimately, we end up that it took uh, 16 seconds. And we can run this again. Uh, sometimes the um, sometimes you'll get quite dramatically different performance stats between runs. Um, I'm trying to get rid of all of the noise that you can get. But when you're working on a large system like Linux, there's not much you can do um, because interrupts will come in and change your performance stats. Um, so we're just running three separate ones. Um, so I, I think this 12 is probably the correct one. I think the 16 is the, the error, but um, this one's 15. So we can see that before we were getting about 3 gigaflops, and now we're only getting, let's say, let's give it 1.2 gigaflops, which if we remember our theoretical maximum was 4,500, now we're running at 26% efficiency. And the reason this is happening is because before we had no dependency between... Uh, the different uh, operations being done. And now that we're doing a fuse multiply add that's summing into ZMM0, and then we immediately go into yet another instruction that's accumulating into ZMM0, this instruction has to complete and then update ZMM0 for this one to be able to pick it up and use it again. So you have a dependency requirement between the instructions. Um, so now what we're going to do is we're going to undo all that, and we're going to look at what it looks like when you unroll one time. So instead of eight times, we're going to look at just one, which should break the dependency, and hopefully it breaks it by enough that, uh, I don't know how to use Vim macros, I need to learn at some point. I'm doing that wrong. What am I doing wrong here? There we go. Um, I know that I could make a macro for this, for this but uh, I'm not a... Not quite a Vim power user. So now we're moving forward by two pixels, and we're going to update this by two, and we're updating that by two. And we can give this a run. So now we have uh, no dependency between the operations uh, because we're swapping between zero and one and zero and one. We can see we got a bunch of panics, which means we made a mistake somewhere because our output is wrong. And the reason is we didn't delete these. 
So that's the nice thing about having a known good example that you're always comparing against, because you don't want to end up falling into a mistake. Once again, we had a problem because we deleted the uh, all the accumulators, or uh, the second accumulator. So this one, hopefully we didn't make any mistakes, and this will have a correct output. So, yeah, when I'm doing optimizations, I will almost always have a naive, known good implementation that I always compare against to make sure I didn't make a mistake. Because uh, when you're working this low with assembly, it's easy to typo, a 4 is a 5, and then all your results are bad. So interestingly, this had almost no effect on performance, but I'm really skeptical of that number. Because I know before I have tried this, and it worked. Um... Interesting. We can also decrease the uh, the number of operations we do. So it actually looks like that hurt performance. And I'm not quite sure why. We can try bringing up the threads. Oops. Um, we can try bringing up the number of threads and dropping the number of tests so it will complete a little bit faster. And we'll see what effect this had. And this is a lot of my optimization process. You're trying things because the little microarchitectural changes are really hard to figure out. So you can see here it took less time because we changed the number of tests so that time number doesn't carry over anymore. Um, but the gigaflops has stayed roughly the same, which is quite interesting. So we're going to go back to this mode. And we're going to look at this, and we shouldn't have any mistakes. Two, two, and two. So the computation should be correct. Why is the performance so bad? Hmm. Zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one. Blah, blah, blah. Interesting. So the gigaflops are a little bit better on this one uh, because we reduced the number of tests, uh, which can increase the noise. The longer you test, the, the less noise that should affect you, uh, although things can cascade and kind of get out of control. So you can see that the performance is kind of jumping around a lot, um, and that makes it kind of hard to determine what's actually going on here. And I suspect the reason it's jumping around a lot is because these are actual memory operations that we're doing. So what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to ignore an actual correct implementation of a convolutional layer. In fact, we're going to ignore the concept of a convolution, convolution as a whole. And we're just going to implement a very simple algorithm that's just going to try and do as many fused multiply adds per second as we can possibly do. So we're going to implement uh, a new function, uh, inline, never. And we're going to call this, uh, it's going to be a public function to make sure that it uh, should stay the exact same format. So nothing really gets optimized in it. It's inline assembly anyway, so it shouldn't. Then we're just going to have uh, try flops. It's going to take no parameters because it's not actually doing any operations. It's going to be unsafe because we have to mark assembly blocks as unsafe. And then this R, uh, if you're not familiar with Rust, um, that's a multi-line comment. And we're going to say we want Intel syntax and it's volatile. So make sure that it doesn't get reordered or optimized out. So here we can just put not. And we'll go down to our main loop. And here we have our, uh, yep, multi-line raw string. Uh, so we're going to look at, previously we were calculating flops as this, but that flop value is not going to be useful anymore as we're going to make our own numbers. Uh, let's just call this, we're going to make another flop. This is going to be convolutions. It's not named correctly anymore, but convolutions is just telling us um, the number of operations that we did per um, total. So number of tests times the number of threads times the vector size. 
So we're gonna take uh, convolutions and then we're just gonna multiply it by two because we're gonna have a really simple layer here. Uh, we're not actually doing any operations. So this num number will be astronomically high because we're just doing a bunch of knobs. Or it might be low, I don't know. Knobs might be really slow. Um, yeah, so in this case, you can see the flops are really low because our call overhead is really high because we're calling nop ret. So inside here, we're just going to put a loop and thus we're going to update our clobbers. We're going to say racks is a clobber. We're going to move into racks uh, or EAX. We're going to put a mil uh, 1 billion into there. Loop. And then uh, actually, this will be a... Uh, decrement EAX and actually we're gonna do sub EAX1 to break the flags dependency um, and then we're going to do a jump if non zero to one backwards so we're just gonna loop and get rid of the NOP so we're just looping a billion times in this inner loop and we're gonna try and make this inner loop as po hot as possible so we get we'll get rid of uh, the outer loop a little bit. So we'll only do 100 outer loops and a bunch of inner loops. I think this will be like, this will probably take forever to run. So I might actually want to make this one. Um, so that actually complete, completed pretty quick. So we're going to do one outer loop in the, uh, which is going to be one call to this function, which we didn't actually change the function that we do, which is something we'll want. It's good to use the function that you're writing, traditionally. So we're doing, we're looping through this once, and, but inside we're gonna do a lot more loops. So we're gonna get rid of all that, all those calls, because the calls can be pretty expensive. Um, this I expect to complete in a little bit more than a second. Yep. So we can see that we did, um, this convolutions now is holding one times vector size times number of threads. We're going to then multiply this by 1 billion. I put the underscores. They're treated as just spacers in Rust, so it makes it a little bit easier to write numbers that are uh, detected. So this will tell us uh, the number of times we did the outer loop times the vector size, so we got to remember that's factored in, times the inner loop times the floating point operations per loop. We don't have any. We just have that set as 2, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, this flops number will be uh, stupid. It will have no meaning. Um, so we're going to then perform uh, a vectored fuse multiply add uh, 213, which I think is the one we were using, right? 231, sorry, of ZM0, ZM1, ZM2. And these have no meaning. We don't actually care about the mathematical operation they're doing. Um, and we're not even going to zero them out, but that could have a huge negative impact. So we will. There can be weird uh, efficiency problems if you don't have things zeroed out, especially when doing floats, because you can start getting uh, not a numbers. Um, so now we have one fuse multiply add and a hot loop. And so we're doing two floating point operations per iteration of the loop, and we're doing this many iterations. That factors in that we're doing 16 at a time. So this will actually be a correct reading of the number of flops that occurred. And I expect this number to be pretty low because the overhead of the loop will be quite high. Uh, oops, this is packed single precision. So this is only to get a theoretical maximum of, or not a theoretical maximum. We know the theoretical maximum. We're trying to get a computational, like in practice, how close can we get to that? Uh, so you can see here, uh, we're only at 474 gigaflops. So this is an extremely hot, extremely tight loop, register only operations. Um, and we're still not even at our peak performance. And the reason is the overhead of the loop is really high and the dependency chain is going to be killing us. So first, we're going to just unroll this. We're going to unroll this, uh, let's say, eight times. 
every time we make a modification to this, we're going to have to update the number of operations that we actually are doing. So in this case, we're doing eight operations and, uh, and two per operation. So now this will give us a little bit more of insight into what happens with unrolling and if there's a diminishing return on unrolling. Um, this will actually take a pretty long time. So we're gonna want to decrease this loop so that the computation finishes a bit faster. So we're just gonna drop a zero. Now the underscores don't really make any sense on that number, but whatever. So we're gonna do 100 million iterations instead. Uh, so here we're still at 474, which is quite interesting, actually. Um, does the number get better if we do two? Maybe unrolling eight times is too much. And it's kind of hard to predict these things without testing. So the Xeon Phi is a really hard architecture to work with because they're atom cores. They are very weak cores. Their branch predictions are weak. Their instruction decodes are weak. They can only decode two instructions per cycle. Uh, and up to, and it since each instruction decode is looking at 16 bytes at a time, if you exceed eight bytes per instruction, then you can only decode one uh, instruction per cycle. And you find out that is very often your bottleneck. In this case, I know these uh, AVX512 operations are actually under eight bytes. So that is currently not a concern. So interestingly here, this gigaflops number is not going up much. So does this mean that I made a mistake in my code here? Or does it mean that the unrolling is having a problem with dependency chains? It could also be uh, working with zeros could have some negative effect. So in this case, um, I don't think there's a dependency on reads of registers, only when you're updating one. Uh, but that's something that we'll be able to probably observe quickly here, make sure that our numbers down here are correct, and they are. And we see here, we just doubled our performance. So we unrolled eight times before and it had no effect on our performance. However, when we changed the dependency, we were able to, yeah, basically double our performance. So does that continue scaling? Let's grab another register, 444, and we'll dump it in here. And down here, we'll change this because now we're doing three operations per iteration. And eventually we'll see when this stops having an effect. And it might, I mean, it's it's continuing to go at that same rate. This is exactly double and this is almost exactly triple the baseline value. So you can see how big of a difference that dependency has. Like in this case, if we go back to these three are dependent, we'll probably go back to the 474. And I think we will find that that 474 is probably, uh, let's see, what is, if we look at this manual, we had the VMFAD, where is it? Vectored fuse multiply add here, it has a latency of six and a theoretical throughput of 0.5. So, if we divide that, we will get the, um, do I want to divide that? Does that make any sense? I don't think so. Wait, does it? Why was I, for some reason I wanted to divide that. Um, but I don't know if that's right. So with the dependency, let's say it is six cycles per instead. So the theoretical maximum we know in an ideal loop is 4,500. Let's divide that by six and we get 750. If we divide that by two, we get 375, which is getting close to this number. I think what's basically happening is you're hitting this like full latency every time, but I'm not, not quite sure about that math. Ignore me. Um, I would love to figure out a little bit more about processor design to uh, be able to calculate the theoreticals a little bit uh, better. So we're gonna change this yet again. We're gonna go up to five. 
uh, since these um, operations are going pretty quick, um, we're going to up this number again. So basically, I always try and keep my benchmarks at about five seconds. So once they get slower, I up the loop count. Once they get uh, faster, or yeah, once, once they start taking too long, I decrease the loop count, vice versa. Um, so let's see. We're doing a ZMM5 here, and then we have to update this down here. I don't know if there's a way to do macros in inline assembly where I could, I know in uh, in NASM I can do like a rep four and then end rep and then the four I could bring in as an immediate parameter and then I magically everything updates uh, already. And then we also changed this back up to a billion, uh, billion, and we will write that out. Someone asked if the stream will be archived and yes it will. Unless I made a catastrophic mistake, uh, the reason I was an hour late on getting this stream up and running was I was trying to make sure that I would have a 4K archive, because I'm actually on a 4K monitor here, um, and I'm, I should be recording this to a 4K output. So I will upload this to YouTube afterwards, uh, and the reason why I don't stream directly to YouTube is it allows me to kind of do post-processing on it, and then upload it separately. So this will show up on YouTube, and I'll announce it on my Twitter once it goes up. So it'll probably go up tonight. Um, it, besides the first, like, five minutes that were silent at the start, there probably won't be any editing. These are meant to be really raw. They're meant to see... You're meant to see how many mistakes someone makes when they're actually doing something. Like, I probably could condense down this stream into, like, five minutes, but... I feel like there's a lot to learn from people's mistakes versus just the actual end result of their stuff. Um, so, we completed this operation. We can see we're now at 1897, so we're just continuing to climb here. Um, so we'll make, we'll break the dependency chain yet again. We'll bring this to six, uh, up to six. So we'll go to five. And so far, this scaling has been pretty much perfectly linear. So there's no reason to really save off these values. We can just say this 474, what is it? 474 times the last one we did. Uh, so we're a little bit below. No, we're actually on par. If we take the 474, multiply it by 4, we get 1896, which is so close to this. It's really fun when you get theoretical performance like you hit that um like everything just scales linearly it's great it's great i don't know i really enjoy this stuff you can see once again we continued scaling at a continue uh at the same rate we're gonna do a bulk operation here i think we're probably gonna be going up to eight anyway so we're just gonna get that one pre-done but we're only gonna go to seven here and then we'll change this up to a six um I could probably automate this if I had a way of feeding in this depth. Um, it's not a big deal. It's not a. It's not too many things that we actually have to search. Now we're at two seven eight three. So we're getting close to where we were uh, when we performed the um, convolution, which was at about twenty nine hundred. So uh, this test now at seven will tell us whether or not we can continue beyond that level. Like, maybe the 2900 is a hard cap, or maybe it's due to our unrolling, or our dependency chains, or the memory accesses, or all these things. So we blew right past it. We're now at 3180. And I guess we're going to keep going. Basically, we're going to go until that number stops. And we're doing it one at a time, so we can keep an eye on the scaling factor to make sure there's no big jump, or it doesn't start going uh, logarithmic. Um, and it'd be interesting if we went over that 4,500 number because we made the assumption that we'd be doing AVX at 1.1 gigahertz, where if we have turbo mode enabled, which I think I do, maybe we'll be at 1.2, where it will be 1.3 plus 100 minus 200, which will put us at that 1.2. We're continuing to scale, which is... Awesome to see. Once again, if we take the 472, multiply it by 8, we're at 3776. So we're no longer linear. When did we stop becoming linear? 472 times 7. 
4304, uh, 472 times 6, 2832. So ever since uh, 6, we've started to fall off a little bit more. So we're going to actually grab this information so we'll be able to plot it because this is this will be interesting. So we'll call this, I uh, actually have a Knight's Landing folder. We're going to call this Fuse Multiply Add uh, Single Precision uh, Independent Load, uh, Independent Op, uh, Independent Unroll. So uh, I do these performance benchmarks all the time. Little tests like this, but I very, very frequently forget to actually save them off. Um, so I'm just trying to make sure I do my due diligence and save off these numbers. So let's look at one was this number. So we're going to have, uh, the unrolled depth, and then we're going to grab the actual performance. And typically I would automate this, but if in this case, we're not really doing too many things. Did we grab the wrong numbers there? I don't, what was this 472? Oh, that, was that going back down? Uh, I think this 1897 is the next one. Five. Uh, six. Yep, this lines up. I'm pretty sure these are correct. So, I know this is boring, but it's, uh, it's what I do a lot. Or, at least to me, it's not boring. So, hopefully it's not boring to you. If you're watching it and you think it's boring, then... Plenty of other things to do with your day. Uh, so, let's see. And if you're bored of this part, then maybe come back later when we're looking at more of neural net implementation. If we get to then, we might spend all day doing optimizations, um, which I love. I, I, I could do this all day. So we're going to do a plot of data.txt using 1 and 2. So uh, x is going to be from the first column, y is going to be from the second column. If you've never used GNU plot before, it's just a really simple plotting software. It's it's not that great. It's it does its job. And then WL is the same as with lines. Uh, so basically, don't plot them as dots. Plot them as lines. And you'll see here. Um, I'm gonna set grid. So we have a grid. And you'll see that the scaling here. I'll make it a little bit bigger. You can see that the scaling here is a pretty damn linear. Like, I'm very happy with that, which is a good sign. Further, I'm going to make another file here. So uh, we're not going to make any changes to this graph anymore. I'm going to make another file. This is going to be test code. And test code, we're just going to yoink this. And it doesn't really matter if it's not very clean. We're just going to throw this in here and save it off, just so we uh, remember roughly what we were doing here, even though it's not 100% correct. So now we're going to go to yet another layer of unrolling. We're going to go into XMM10, and this one, the alignment's going to be off here. Um, I like keeping all my code nice and aligned. It makes it easier to tell errors, and it just, I don't know, I think it's cleaner. It, it doesn't, doesn't matter. Do whatever you like for code. We're going to run this one, and this will be our ninth data point. So I'm curious if we will go over that 4,500 theoretical target that we computed before. Um, and we're, we're, we're chugging along. This has actually got a really good sign. So uh, before I did the stream, I looked on Stack Overflow, and someone else had a very similar problem. They were stuck at 65% efficiency. And... Uh, I didn't know if it was just fundamentally the like theoretical benchmark just didn't make much sense because theoretical benchmarks can be that. You're relying on everything to be working perfectly with each other. All right, so here, ooh, that one did not go up much. It did go up, but not much. I think that is our first pretty big failure, but we're going to keep pushing it out. We're gonna step this up. Uh, wait, what did I do here? Okay, I am on 11 now. These, uh, interesting. 
Okay, so the ZMMs are one below. I was confused, like, why that was getting close to the actual... Uh, 12, 13, 12, 13, 12, 13. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. I feel like I missed something, like something showed up out of nowhere, but it looks like we're good. And from this, I think we can conclude that read-only parameters do not have a dependency chain, uh, which is nice to know. This will be our 11 benchmark. And then down here, we're going to change this to 12. Write it out now that it's built. Uh, oops. There's 12. So that jumped up quite a bit. That might... This 48 and 9 might have been a blip in that, uh, might have been a blip in terms of we just got a bad capture. We just, the numbers were a little bit off. Um, I don't know, maybe we had a lot of interrupts going on that time or something. So keep in mind this is a box I'm SSH'd into. It's not the same one I'm doing encoding on. You wouldn't want to do encoding and optimization on the same box because then you're, like, fighting for CPU time. And that one just, that, that's below, that is above our theoretical. So uh, we'll probably recompute 10 once we kind of cap out, which is hopefully soon. I wasn't expecting to have to go this deep, but I'm very happy that we're going this deep because it means we have a lot of room to improve, maybe. So now we're up to 13. And let's just double check to make sure that's correct. Yep, 13 operations. Um, so I'm hoping that we stop, we plateau perfectly at some value that matches a theoretical computation. Uh, that one dropped down, which at this point we could have diminishing returns on the unrolling, the loop, the, uh, the jump size might be pretty long, and that might have a negative effect. So typically, once I start running into diminishing returns, I'll get a couple more samples uh, so that we can view the characteristics of the diminishing returns to see if they're that bad. So, like, it, can you just unroll as much as you want? And sure, there might be some diminishing returns, but is it that big of a deal where you need to worry about, like, un-unrolling your code? Um, so we'll go to 14 now. And it, at this point, it could also be like an even or odd number of instructions. It could be the uh, branch target alignment. We don't have our branch aligned, uh, which is kind of a mistake. But I've noticed that on Xeon 5s, it hasn't been a huge noticeable thing. So now we've hit another new maximum here. Uh, ZMM 16, this is going to put us into the uh, AVX 512 register file. Um, so the encoding of this, so the encoding of these, uh, actually all of these are going to be AVX encodings. In this case, these are all going to be uh, standard, um, what is it, AVX encodings, is it VEX encodings? And then the XMM 16, since we're in the uh, higher 16 registers now, uh, we're actually going to start hitting evex encodings, which is going to change the size of our... Oh, we didn't update. Uh, this we updated, so that's 15, but we didn't update the number down here. Um, so the evex encoding will probably add one more byte to the operation, but it will still stay within that 8-byte limit that we don't want to exceed. Otherwise, otherwise we'll start having catastrophic failure. Um, in this case... It is not happy with that because it needs AVX 512DQ. Um, so we might need to change our zeroing to V0 all, I think. We will double check that. If we look at night landing SDM2, which is the instruction set reference. Then we will look at, uh, I think it's V0 all, which should zero out all uh, registers. So keep in mind, we're not updating the clobbers of the inline assembly, which is a big no-no, but it shouldn't really matter because all of the uh, XMMs and ZMMs in uh, SysV ABI are volatile. V0 all, zero all YMM registers. So we're just going to do that instead of manually specifying this. 
Um, and the reason for that is I don't think you can actually do a ZMM0 using that XOR without, as this is saying, it requires the DQ ISA, which is the, and the VL. I can't remember which ones they are. So AVX 512, that's something that's fun to go into, um, has a bunch of different kind of like sub architectures. And the phi, uh, here we can see what they are. We've got F, which is the foundation, CDI, which is conflict detection, which is only on the night's landing. Uh, ERI, which is exponential, oh, they're right down here. Exponential and reciprocal instructions, uh, which are approximate uh, reciprocal and exponential computations. They're meant to be very fast. And PFI, prefetch instructions. These are both on night's landing. AVX 512F will be present on the Skylake EP model, which I think is coming out this fall. Um, BWDQ and VL. Uh, BW is byte and word instructions. DQ is double word and quad word. So basically, you get AVX 512 support for 8-bit and 16-bit integer operations. I do not have that on the PHY. Um, I do not have DQ either. So... Um, I have a lot of 32-bit and 64-bit AVX 512 instructions, but this one just adds more. Um, and then AVX 512 VL, which is the other thing it's saying, is that it expands most operations to also operate on XMEMs and YMEMs. So if I have an AVX 512 operation, it'll back, not backport, but it means I can use, I can do 128-bit operations on something that might be 512-bit uh, specific. Uh, integer fuse mu multiply add. I actually didn't know this was scheduled. Uh, fuse multiply add of integers using 52-bit precision. 52-bit um, precision is interesting because it's used for the uh, is it the mantissa of the of 64-bit operations. So you'll find that AVX. Sorry about the zoom on here. There is a really weird. Uh, instruction and I don't quite understand the use of it yet but there's some good documentation on it where is it uh, I'm just gonna search 52 nope uh, another good way to sometimes find these instructions is to just look at uh, Intel intrinsics guide this is a really nice web interface to searching all of the C intrinsics, and they also tell you the assembly uh, opcodes that they actually use for these things. So if we look for uh, 52, uh, here we have, yeah, the multiply add high EPU 64. So multiply packed unsigned 52-bit integers in each 64-bit element to form a 104-bit immediate result, and then put the add the high intermediate with the corresponding, like, Apparently, this has some, like, really weird optimization properties, I think, for RSA, because you can uh, do, like, the 52-bit operation. I Basically, what happened is someone wrote a blog about, hey, Intel, expose your 52-bit, like, multiply and adder units, because you know they have to exist in the FPUs for floats. So, like, expose them for... Um, integer operations and uh, and he mentioned like a reason for it because it sped up some certain operation I don't remember which one it is but uh, whatever it there is there is a reason for it uh, anyways that's kind of cool to see we were looking at uh, AVX 512 uh, VBMI so bits byte manipulation stuff which are not present um, so Adds vector byte permutation instructions. Okay. I'm not really sure what they're planning. Knight's Mill, that's going to be the next generation. So, uh, specialized for deep learning. And I think they're adding some... Yeah, the vector neural network instruction word variable precision. Yes, the 4VNN IW instruction set. My favorite. Uh, vector instructions for deep learning, enhanced words, and variable precision. I don't remember... Uh, what these actually are. I don't know if they've mentioned too much what they're meant for. Um, but I can guarantee you the second Knight's Mill is out there and available, I will be buying it because it will be pretty fun to work with. Uh, 
And then fuse multiply accumulation in a packed single precision. Uh, fuse multiply accumulation packed single precision. Huh. Interesting. I'm not sure what that's for. I don't know if that's a horizontal accumulation because then you'd be able to... So we're able to vectorize this easily because we're doing 16 convolutions at a time but it's very difficult to vectorize a single convolution because you would have to do multiple operations in parallel when you're dealing with kind of a serial stream. If uh, ABX offered a... Um, if they offered a... Uh, horizontal add that was very cheap, then what you could do is you could have your kernel in one register, uh, like your nine entries in the kernel, you multiply that with nine input floats, and then you do an accumulator, uh, a horizontal accumulator of those nine things, and then you'd be able to vectorize serial uh, convolutions. So I'm not sure if that's something they're planning on doing. They haven't done a horizontal ad in a while. Uh, and then there are these op masks, which I haven't talked about yet, and we might get into that because uh, it allows us to do partial register registers. Uh, I'll talk about that later because we're, we're on enough of a tangent. But basically, AVX 512 has some really cool features, and they're just adding more and more and more instructions. Um, so where did we leave off here? We're here, we have V0 at all, we did 16. Uh, interesting. I don't think I ever recorded the 15. I don't know. Yeah, I never did. So we're gonna do 15. 15 is already set there. Sorry, lost, lost track, went on a tangent. Okay. So, once again, this is kind of the, if I had the notes, very first thing was to calculate theoretical performance, which we already did, and then uh, we're going to calculate the in-practice performance. So, how close can we get to the theoretical? And this 4,500 is proving to be a pretty concrete barrier uh, in terms of we're not getting too far past it. We're going to put a hard stop at 16. So, this is the last operation we're going to do, and we're going to be done with this uh, back and forth, because at this point, I think we understand the shape of the uh, unrolling. So, Knight's Landing is a very interesting architecture in that the cores are very weak. As I said before, they're little atoms. Um, and, okay, while that is the highest number we've had, it's not much different than 14. So, interestingly here... There might be like an even and odd thing. This was good. This was good. This was good. It might be like evens versus odds. All of the ones that were below expected were all odd numbers of unrolling. I don't know if that has to do with loop uh, unrolling. So we're going to drop back to 15. We're going to drop this down so we're at 15 again. And then we're going to align this loop. So we're going to align, so the branch target is 16-byte uh, aligned. Interesting. I'm curious if that even and odd has some weird effect. Because it definitely seems to, and it reproduces. So there's something about having an odd number of things going on. And I think the reason for that is that the reciprocal throughput is is uh, 0.5, so the throughput is 2. So if you... This allows us to do... Uh, when, when you have an even amount, each cycle dispatches two of those things. However, if you have an odd amount, the last dispatch will only benefit from getting one done in that cycle, and then you're going to hit the sub-instruction, which will introduce the latency of the sub-operation, which I think is 1. Um, and then you're going to loop around. So I'm pretty sure that the difference between the even and the odds here is whether or not um, you completely use up all of the cycles. Uh, I, I think that makes a lot of sense in my head, but I don't know if that's actually the case. Um, so let's see. Now we can plot this data, and we can see the 
uh, kind of performance we have as we go up. So one up through, it looks like at about 10, uh, 9 actually, is where we start falling off and flattening out. There's still a little bit of a climb here, but it's right at this 4,500, which as we saw before was our, our theoretical computation, uh, this like 4,505. Um, so I'm pretty happy to believe that that 4,500 is the theoretical max and we're actually hitting it. So that's a good sign. All right. So with this knowledge, we know that we want to unroll an even number of times Ideally, we want to always be working out of registers, um, and so on and so forth. So, in this case, we have 15. We're going to go back to 16 operations, uh, because it's even. And now we're going to start doing benchmarks, very similar to as before, but we're going to add, start adding some memory uh, inputs into these things. And we're going to see how much of an effect the memory has on it. And if memory doesn't have an effect on it, then it means our uh, convolution implementation could be improved. There's a possibility that there's just no way we're going to improve this uh, once we start adding memory accesses. So first we need to pass in some valid memory. So let's do, um, we're gonna do let word equals OF32, uh, so a 32-bit float. Then we're gonna pass this in as an input. We don't care which register it goes in. We're gonna pass in the address of the word and we're gonna cast it to a pointer because uh, we have to pass it in here. So basically get the address of the word and then get the pointer uh, of it. Or even more specifically, we could pass it in as an actual uh, U size. Um, I know in inline assembly you can do like the M to pass in memory, but Rust is having problems with that right now. So I'm just avoiding that entirely. I'm treating everything as register. Further, since I'm doing memory operations, I need to add a memory clobber. Even though I'm only reading memory, uh, it means that all the memory will be flushed out before I start using it. And then here we're going to do a 1 to 16 broadcast. Um, and we're going to go through here. And for all ZMM2s, uh, ZMM2 we're going to replace with a 1. Hopefully these brackets don't need to be escaped, but I think they might need to be... Nope, we got lucky. I think Vim has like weird lazy bracket stuff. And actually we want 0. We want $S, $1, $0G. So now we're doing the exact same computation that was getting us about 4,500, 4,600... Uh, gigaflops, and now we're doing memory operations on the same thing, so it will be hot in cache. And we're at 4400, um, which is a really good sign. It means that we're able to basically perform... That is, that is really nice. It basically means we can perform these with memory inputs as long as they're in L1 cache, or in this case, they might even, I don't know if they're like load buffery things. Um, I think that's just a weird anomaly there. So I think this just symbolizes more and more that we have a lot of room for improvement on our convolution implementation. Uh, further, this is not a terribly good test because we're not doing uh, sequential um, accesses. So let's do, uh, we're unrolling 16 times, so let's put 16 floats here, and then we're going to change these to be f uh, plus 4 times uh, 0 through 16, or we can actually just do it by hand. Oh, so 8, uh, 0, 4, and we're going to grab these as we go. I think that's about 16, 13. 14 through 16. Okay. 8C, 0, 4, 8C, 0, 4, 8C, 0, 4, 8C. And then 1, 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 2, 2, 3. Oops. 2, 3, 3, 3, 3. Is that correct? 
16 operations, and then we have to break the dependencies. So, all right. So now we can see what it looks like when we're actually accessing unique memory for each one. Uh, so it might be a little bit more hostile. And we'll see if we drop down to that 3000 number that we experienced in our convolution implementation. And if we did, uh, and we didn't. So that means I think we have room to improve. Uh, we either need to increase the cache efficiency of our convolutional neural net, or our convolution implementation. Um, yeah, this is definitely still in, still in cache. So the question is, how can we block our convolution implementation? I'm pretty happy with all the information that we got from that. It basically means that as long as everything fit in L1 cache, um, and the operations are predicted by the, uh, the prefetcher, then we're pretty much good. So let's see, now we'll go back to the convolution. We're going to change the number of tests back up. And this should hopefully be back in original operational state, unless I had some, I don't know if I like commented some things out that will break everything, but we should see about that 3000 number again. Uh, width times height times nine times two, that's correct. The loops are good. Okay, we're back at about the 2000 end. Um, okay, so the question is, why is this having problems? So one thing that could be a problem is that the, um, hmm, because here we effectively have unrolled, well, I guess from our research we found we want to unroll, uh, an even number of times well, an odd number of times doesn't seem to have a, an effect early on, but we want to unroll up to probably 12, 12, 14, or 16 times. Uh, we do have the register space to do 16 unrolls. That will put a strong constraint on our um, width of our input. It'll say that our input width has to be a factor of 16. Um, Obviously, we could have multiple unrolls. We could have a 16 unrolled version and then a one unrolled version, and then we pick between which one we use based on how much more data we have to process in the width. But since right now we're doing very experimental things, we're going to make the constraints a lot easier to work with. Uh, so we're just going to say the input data width has to be mod 16. Um, and let's just make sure we have... Uh, space. We have 32 registers. We're consuming 9 there, which leaves us with uh, 23 registers, and we need 16 accumulators. So we've got plenty of room there. So, uh, to initialize these values, um, I'm going to do an XOR on the first one, because I can, and then... I th I'm going to look at uh, Agner Fogg's table to try to determine whether I want to use an XOR or a move. So I'm using a V XOR PS. We can see that this has a 2 cycle latency and 0 0.5 reciprocal throughput. And then we can look at uh, V move P, uh, V move UPS. Um, this is on Bulldozer, which is uh, not the one we want. We had run the wrong thing. So we can see that a move has a latency of 9. Uh, that is with a memory operand. A vmove APS or UPS. An APS from vector to vector has a latency of 2 and a reciprocal throughput of 0.5. So it doesn't really matter. It can be executed on both FP0s fp ones so X or PS can be on zero and one. So it doesn't really matter. Um, so we're going to use uh, V move uh, APS, XMM1, XMM0. And the reason we're going to use APS is just because it's a little cleaner. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 
Uh, we have our kernels here, which is a problem. I might move our kernels into the 20s. We're just going to move them up there. We're going to need to change our convolutions once we get there. Um, but that's fine. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. So, zero out XMM0, and then move that into all of these. I think this is correct. If we make mistakes, then our hopefully they will be caught by our test. And these kernels, we're going to have to change all these. I hope you can't hear the keyboard too much. I try to have the microphone in front of it, and it's a directional microphone, so the keyboard noise is probably audible, but a lot more quiet than it actually is. Um, so, now we've just zeroed these things out. We're just testing that the computation still succeeds, uh, which it does. Uh, the gigaflops are pretty low here because now we have a lot of overhead on these moves. Um, that will go away as we do more mathematical operations in the actual loop itself. So, we know that the maximum performance that we've uh, been able to really achieve was about the three gigaflops. And we know that theoretically with memory operations and no dependencies and all the memory in L1 cache and with predictable strides, we're able to hit 4,500, which is our theoretical maximum. So let's try and do that. So, this is going to get really, really ugly. Because we're going to do 16 convolutions. We're going to do 16 vectors of convolutions at a time. So 16 components of the vector. And in each loop, we're going to compute 16 convolutions as well. So we're going to be doing, uh, what is 16 times 16? Is that uh, 256 or I don't know. 128. I'm really bad at mental math. Okay. Uh, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Right? That's... That is our first one. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. You know what? You know what? We can write, we can write code for this. We are at the point where we will write a Python script to generate this stuff. So this is going to be unroll gen. Because this does have a predictable shape. So gen.py. I think 24 is the font that I've decided works pretty well. And basically, I want to do unroll depth is 16. And we're using uh, kernel base is 20. So what we're going to do is for uh, on roll, uh, for accumulator in range on roll depth, we'll do a print of VFM add 231 PS ZMM percent D comma space ZMM percent D comma, space, uh, then, let's see, we want to do dollar one plus, this is going to be another parameter times four, one, two, 16. All right, and we're going to bring in the accumulator, will be the first ZMM, then we will have the kernel base plus the um, plus the convolution and then we're gonna have plus the index I think so we're gonna do an outside loop which is for each convolution in zero uh, oops, range 9. And then for uh, index in range 9. Or in range 16. 
Alright. Or is this unroll depth as well? Uh what am I doing here? Let's see if this is right. Is this so we will have Sorry, I'm having a brain fart right now. Because I need to go... I have different things I'm tracking. This will just go 0 through 16 for each one, which is correct with the accumulator. So we're going to output 9 things for each. And then the index will be a separate... Is that just... I'm gonna keep that as zero. I'm gonna I'm gonna look at the shape of this and make sure I'm not going crazy. It's, I know it's pretty obvious to someone probably watching. It's not a not a particularly hard. Oops. Properties font twenty eight. Uh, okay. So we're gonna do Python gen .py, and we're gonna do one. So we're just gonna look at the very first layer. And we want to basically get this output, uh, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, where we have, this is a correct thing for one layer. So we've got the outputs correct, the inputs are correct. Then we have the, this is the only thing and it needs to go up each time. It is ack plus conv. So 0 through 15, and then when we up this to 9, and we'll add another print at the end. So, I think this is right. And then this one will start 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 16, 2 through that, which is correct. Except for once we get to 3, because once we get to 3, we need to go to the new layer. So we're going to do... Uh, Let's see. Uh, <laughs> offset equals this. If offset is greater than three, or actually, offset is that. Then we're gonna do uh, row is offset divided by three. And then we're gonna do offset equals offset mod three. So now, we will use offset for the offset. So two, that's uh, uh, offset is that. We always add the conv to this. Offset is the ac, right? No, offset is the conv. And this we add the ac. Sorry. Uh, okay, so this looks correct. So we have 0 through 15, 1 through 16, 2 through 17, 0 through 15, so on and so forth. That is correct. Then we have to add one more parameter. If row is greater than, if row is 0, then we print this. Otherwise, we have to print it with the row index which is five times percent D plus that. And this parameter will be here and it will be row. So if row is zero, then we don't output that. Um, I The reason I'm doing this as two separate ifs is I don't know if you can multiply a scalar by zero and have the compiler just omit that scalar. And then these are correct as well. I think I think this works. So we will see. Uh, and then this will allow us to very quickly make different unroll depths. Uh, oops. Okay. That's the new one. That is huge. Just, just unrolling things, no big deal. And get the tabs right, everything's zeroed. Those look correct. Then we index by 16. We index the result by 16, and we index the row increment by 16. 
Oh, please work. Oh, crap. Oh, we broke it. Oh, what did we do? 16 times 4. 16 times 64. 16. Correct. These are panicking due to a mismatch on 32. 32. Are we going out of bounds? I think we are. Yeah, I'm pretty sure we're going out of bounds here because by the time we do our x plus 3, no, that should be in bounds. It'll be... Math, carry the 2. The output is 32. The input is 34. That should be fine. We should be able to index 17 from... Is that correct? Uh, 15. One. Oh. Oh, yeah, that's fine. Um, five. What am I doing wrong here? Oh, I'm not outputting anything. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, and zero, zero. Putting zeros here for padding. Zero, four, eight, C, zero, four, eight, C, zero, four, eight, C, zero, four, eight. C and then one 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 two 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 let's see so this I think is correct now oops Come on. Hey, it worked. And performance was not very good. Um, hmm. Did we unroll too much? Did we unroll too little? I, mm, let's see. So these are all sequential accesses, as we saw before, which was fine and dandy. The... They are independent operations, so that should not be a problem. Huh. I wonder if we're hurting the predictors here for some reason. Because we our stride is like we're climbing one, and then we like drop down and we climb uh or we yeah, we like climb up and down and so we have like this sawtooth pattern here. Um, and that might be hurting the branch predictor. But I'm not quite sure. Another thing is we can just up the number of iterations to just make sure. Another thing is we might not be an L1 cache. Uh, a 32 by 32 image times 4. No, that'll be an L1. Come on. Huh. 1,200. Interesting. What am I doing wrong here? Or it's unrolled too much. Add 16. 16's added there. 16's added there. We know the results are correct. Let's make sure all our numbers are correct. Output width, output height, 9 and 2. Uh, convolutions, spec size, num test, num threads. So we can look at this on a single core and see if it's uh, if it behaves better on a single core by a landslide, then I would expect that we're having some caching issues. 
So if we take 4,500 divided by 16, we have a theoretical maximum for a single core is 70 gigaflops, and we're at 64. So this seems to be a scaling problem. Interesting. Because that's putting us at, what, 64 over 70, which is 92% efficiency, which is... A, a, a I'm pretty happy with that. So, are we thrashing... How are we thrashing the caches so much? So, we know that caches are shared. So, we could look at running 32 threads. I don't know if Linux are... If Linux has the thread IDs allocated in a way that I'll be on different L1 caches. But it could be that... Hmm. So, I know with... We can change the stride as well here. Uh, so 4,500 by, by 2. We're expecting 2,250 here. That is pretty poor. So we might be sharing threads. So what we'll do is where we create our threads, we'll do ii times 2. We'll just make sure we remove that later. So each will assign uh, core 0 and core 2 and core 4 and core 6 and so on and so forth. And we'll see if this has a positive effect. And if it does, and it, it did, <laughs> it had a huge effect. So that shows that we're having problems on that L1 cache. Because each, our original test that we did when we were doing uh, the hot loop of register and memory fetches, is they were all, no, they were working on unique data. So I'm dealing with, a pretty big problem where the they are definitely thrashing L1. Like I'm getting more efficiency running half the cores. So I'm gonna quickly use the restroom. I will be back in a minute, and then we'll uh, start looking at the architectural design of the Phi's uh, caches and try to figure out why this problem might be occurring and how we can remedy it. All right, I'm back, and okay, so effectively when we're running on 32 of the 64 cores, we're at uh, 1931 over 4500 over 2, we're at 80, 86% efficiency, and I'd be very happy if we can hit that. Like, if that, if, if that is what we can reach on all cores, that will be good enough for me. Obviously, 99% efficiency would be great. Uh, but in a realistic scenario, we're dealing with a lot of data inbound. We're not dealing with operating on the same data over and over like we were in our hot test before. We have new data coming in. So I would expect at least some hit there. So first of all, um, let's take a look at uh, some of the internal microarchitecture of Knight's Landing. There's a good uh, presentation that came out, which is this. It's just found online. Um, this guy actually, uh, he co-authored the Xeon Phi High Performance Programming Book, which is specifically for Knight's Landing. Um, he's a big principal engineer at, uh, at Intel. So, sorry that that flickering is happening. It's, I see it on my end too. Um, so, let's see. Talks about some crap. Uh, this is how big the processor is, by the way. It's gigantic. It is 
like the physical package is like twice the size of a normal uh, normal processor. Uh, this kind of talks about some of the layout. So they have all these tiles. There's two cores per tile. The L1 cache is shared per tile. Um, wait, is it? Or is there L1 per core? The L2 is per tile. Uh, let's see. Two, each tile is two cores. Two VPUs per core, so vector processing units, and one meg of L2 per tile. Okay. So, L2, it's uh, one meg, 16 way, one line read, and one half line write per cycle. Okay. So, you can read a full cache line per thing. Okay. So... One of the very first things that we can do as kind of a crude thing is we will disable our tests because we're we're gonna va we're going to invalidate the operations we're performing. Then we're going to get rid of these stores. So we are not actually going to store the results of the computations. We're only going to perform the computations, um, and uh, we'll run it on 32 threads. And then uh, we have to change our times two that we added here when we go back to 64 threads. And you can see that had a pretty profound impact on the performance. So I think what might be happening here is maybe it's a write problem and not a read problem. And yeah, look at that. Look at that. So we are back at 64 threads. And we're doing all of the computations of the convolution, and we're at 4,000 gigaflops. So the writing of that data is killing us. Like, that is, that is very good performance. I'm very happy with that. Another thing is we can look at 256 threads. This will be a much longer test. This will take about 20 seconds. Uh, this might have diminishing returns where the threads are thrashing each other, but I think it's 32 by 32 image. Um, I don't know if you can hear that server, but it's screaming in the other room right now. <laughs> so it's a half... Um, it's a 2U chassis that has four nodes in it. Interesting. So it uh, actually scaled with 256 threads as well which is a great sign. So another thing we can do now is see if getting rid of the, uh, if we can do the writes with 256 threads and the uh, task switching of the threads itself, like the um, internally when the writes are blocking it does some math, potentially we might just hide this write problem with threads. Um, Given the sound of the computer right now, it sounds a little bit quieter, meaning it's probably not doing as much. It's getting louder. Hmm. So this is this might take quite a long time to compute. Um, but yeah, basically our bottleneck here is actually on the right. So here we're at 2139. So before, I think we were at 1,000. So spinning up threads did have a positive effect on the actual performance there. They hid some of the problems with writing out the data. But we're going to ignore that for now. But we know that computationally, we have unrolled this to a very good level. So, one of the things that we can look at very quickly is what is the alignment of our output data? Um, whoa, what happened there? Wait, what? Interesting. We just got a 3,000 on when we're actually writing out the data. I think potentially my output buffer might not be 64 byte aligned in some cases. So we're gonna add some assertions there. Assert that out dot as pointer uh, as a u size mod 64 is zero. So make sure that the 
we want the data to be 64 byte aligned and we want the actually that one doesn't really matter we want data to be 64 byte aligned the output to be 64 byte aligned and the output 2 to be 64 byte aligned as well as uh, the kernel it doesn't matter like the kernel we preload those values so uh, it's not a big deal um, data dot data okay so it passed the alignment checks so it's aligned I don't know why we got the bad result before where it was a thousand and maybe it's just the allocator sometime is giving us unaligned things but we definitely know that we are having some bottleneck here so i think this will put us into 4000 territory and while we did see 4500 in our test i think 4000 is probably the maximum when we actually have streaming input data um yeah okay so uh, one thing we can do is try to figure out if a single write has the same effect. And this will kind of tell us that we might be thrashing the cache by having uh, both an input and an output buffer. And like switching between those buffers is throwing a big curveball in. That doesn't seem to be it. So let's do half the writes. We'll write up through ZMM7 and see if that has an effect. And now we're at 3600. So that's working out fairly well in terms of performance. So it seems to be some, there's definitely decay there, but it's not nearly as much as when we have all the cores. Uh, actually, if, hmm. Yeah. Okay. So another thing we can do is we can look at doing a non temporal uh, store. Now, I tried this yesterday, and I had some pretty catastrophic problems where it was just getting much worse but if I look at actually I'll, I'll just use the intrinsics guide because it's searchable uh, yeah intrinsics guide this and then we're gonna look for uh, come on we're gonna look specifically at AVX 512 and we're gonna look for non temporal so it is move NTPS. Uh, okay. So store 512 bits composed of 16 things into memory using a non temporal memory hint. Must be aligned at a 64 byte boundary or GPF will be generated. So we're going to change all of these into from the VMove UPS into VMove NTPS, I think is what it was. Oops. What did I do there? This S V move UPS V move NTPS G. Right, that's what we want. V move NTPS. Yep. And non temporal stores should uh, avoid the cache. So I'll basically queue them up to go out to memory, but they won't actually store in cache. So if I'm having thrashing of storing. If I'm evicting some of my inputs to make room for the outputs that I'm not using, uh, hopefully that gets, this gets rid of it. However, as we're seeing here, it has it's a lot slower, and I, I don't know why. It should it should have no effect because we're not actually using the input. So we're, let's look in the manual quick and see what it says about it. Uh, so there's a uh, I think there is a Knight's Landing optimization guide somewhere. Hmm. I don't know if this will cover uh, Fuse Multiply Add Instruction Guidelines. Let's see. They perform them, blah, blah, blah. I'm just looking at the section because it's kind of relevant. Deck EAX, jump not zero, loop, cost per iteration, 
is the FMA latency. Yep. Uh, oh, let's actually see. Maybe someone else says, can just tell us how we're supposed to unroll this. Um, unrolling at PS, blah, blah, blah. Uh, that puts a vector shifts. Interesting. Knight's Landing Microarchitect. Oh, I didn't know there was a section on this. Knight's Landing Microarchitecture and Software Optimization. Okay. Oh, this is neat. It's, some of this text is pretty sloppily done, but at least the data is here. So we can see branch predictors, allocate and rename. Uh, we've got our integer units, our two FP units. Our two vector ALUs, uh, I'm guessing this is per core. Rename, register file, yep, okay. So two out of order IA processor cores supporting four-way hyperthreading, one meg per two processor cores in a tile. Uh, so it looks like each core has its own L1, yep. Uh, a caching homing agent, each processor core, is dedicated VPU, uh, out of order, blah, 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 four logical, two processor, front end, can fetch, uh, we'll go back to this, can fetch 16 bytes per cycle, decoders can decode two of not more than 24 bytes in a struct. Uh, in cycle. Interesting. Okay. Um, decoders can provide a single U up per instruction. Blah, blah, blah. Out of order engine. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. Going through. Where's all our stuff here? So, vector loads. So, I wonder if it's worth mixing in the stores with the uh, actual operation. So as we compute something, store it uh, versus holding it forever. And that should free up some in the register file as well. Untile mode. Let's see, what are the subsections here? Coding recommendations. Uh, memory optimization. There's a small performance hit when straddling a line, of course. Uh, prefetching can be useful. Hardware prefetcher. Okay. Two types in a tile. The instruction pointer and data one. Uh, the prefetcher will attempt to insert hardware prefetches to the L1 cache if a stride at access is detected. Uh, how many can it detect? Is it just one? Compiler may insert NOPs to make instructions that access memory go into different table entries. Okay. Uh, hardware prefetcher, it can track 48 access patterns at a time, 48 detectors, blah, blah, blah. Uh, if multiple access patterns are done within the same four kilobyte region, the detector can get confused and fail to detect the stream. That is definitely something we could run into right now. If it will not stream across a 4K boundary. Interesting. So we could change our stride in a weird way that we go, so right now we're striding along X, but we could try and stride along Y, which would uh, still be 32 times 4, 128 byte strides, which means we would be more likely to stride a 4K. That could be interesting. Software prefetch, of course. Uh, it'll show more benefit than L1 prefetches, yep. Memory execution cluster. I don't know what that is. Through dispatch, blah, blah, blah. I want cache hit. Store forwarding. Okay. 
streaming store, I can probably switch his CD RAM. So I want to see Temporal somewhere, but I don't see. Hopefully there's a section on Temporal stores. Not temporally, Jason. Uh, prefetches and non temporal stores. Lessen the overhead of memory transactions by preventing second level cache pollution. Okay, so. Doesn't seem to be much on that. But basically, we don't want uh, non temporal. So, another thing we can do is let's put our stores. This is a lot of scrolling. Let's put our stores after the computation uh actually we don't want it there we want it hmm so we could intermix these cmm1 there we go okay that ah, i wish i knew how to do this as a macro there's got to be a simple way of doing this so basically we're going to interleave these and hopefully this will allow some level of uh, potentially this will allow some level of I don't, I, don't, I don't know I'm just going for a guess of the out of order execution should maybe be able to hide some of the latencies of these things and we'll do mathematical operations while we're waiting for the writes to complete. So before we were at about 3,000 when writing out and 4,000 when not writing. And it looks like uh, we're at about that 3,000 still. So that didn't seem to have any effect. Not too surprised there. So I'll undo that. Huh. So add 16... So why is storing the data so expensive? Um, hmm. oh, this one's gonna be really slow. I don't understand how like sometimes it's much slower than others. I wonder if that's like a NUMA thing where I'm getting allocated on the wrong node. Uh, because, like, these have radically different outputs. Actually, I was running the wrong thing, but it doesn't matter. Huh. Okay, so uh, we can start looking at if we can change these access patterns. Uh, so potentially the... Well, we know the predictors are working for this. So what is causing a problem with these stores? Because they're all sequential, they're all aligned, but yeah, sometimes it's just so much slower. Hmm. So this will invalidate the results, but we're gonna not increment the output pointer. We're just gonna output at the same place. And maybe it is that we're not fitting our Okay, so that was pretty fast, 3,500. Maybe there's enough noise there. Nope, still 3,500. That looks pretty stable. So our output vector is going to be 32 times 32 uh, pixels times 4 bytes times 16 uh, vectors. So we're outputting 64K. Ah, that's what it is. I think we are actually getting out of L1 cache. So, in this case, the performance is uh, mediocre, um, and we can try a prefetch. I don't remember what the prefetch instruction is. Uh, actually, is there any point in prefetching on a right? I don't think so. So I'm going to change these to non-temporals again, now that we're looking at a single location, and see if that has an effect. So. Doop, 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 doop. 
If this is super slow as well, then I'm not quite sure when you would want to use a non-temporal store. Hmm. Yeah, that's quite slow. Okay, so that's definitely not the way to go. Um, another thing is we can change these into uh, vmove APS. So there's no benefit of having the aligned versus unaligned instruction. The aligned one just checks. If it's already aligned, the unaligned will be just as fast. Just in case, for some reason, I make this unaligned, this would fault now. So it's just a safety check to make sure I'm not running into alignment problems. And that was only 3,000. Huh. That is very strange. 3,500. Huh. So it really does seem that we're running into a bottleneck on the actual output. And why could that be? Why could that be? We could try... Move the convolution forwards. We could move that down. Because that doesn't need to be there. I don't think that has a dramatic effect. Like, maybe that is switching us from vector mode to um, back into scalar. And, like, that ad was kind of disrupting the flow of things. But I don't think that would be the case. Uh... Hmm. You know, there's that 3,000 again. How are we going to get past this 3,000 bottleneck? So the one thing we could look at would be up the uh, width of the image. Let's do 120, 130, so 128, because we need the divisibility there. And before we had 32, 32 by 32 divided by 128, so 8. So we're going to do uh, an image that's wider so that that inner loop is uh, more common. So the, the branches in the phi are pretty slow. So you want to do them as rare as possible. You, you want to stay in the same loop as much as possible. Um, that had a pretty dramatically negative impact. Interesting. I don't know if that was a fluke or not. Yeah, that seemed to be a fluke. That's another thing that's frustrating, is why, why are there these weird flukes? Okay, so how can we change these access patterns a bit? So, um, I don't think that there's, like, a load buffer where things will get potentially cached. Sorry, my AC just turned on. It will turn off in a second. I, you might not be able to hear it anyways. Um, so, if we look at, this is the same diagram we saw before. The data cache is 32 kilobytes eight way. Uh, okay. So, since we are looking at a uh, 128 by 8 times 64, we are exceeding that. So by doing the writes, we might be evicting cash. So I bet if we drop this to 1, so now we're not 64k, but we're 16k? No, 8k. Uh, whoops. Whoops. The height needs to be at least 3. So now the output will be 128 times 1 times 64, so 8K. So there we're back up to our 3500, which was the most we've ever observed when we're actually doing streaming computation. So it looks like, yeah, it was a caching problem. And honestly, I don't think there's much I can do about that. Uh, let's see, can I do blocking? Can I block? 
Let's see. I don't think blocking would be any benefit. I think that was another fluke run. Yeah. Oh, these runs are really quick. Um, so blocking, what I mean by blocking is basically on the outs, like you try to do more on the inside. Uh, so like you would move some of the Y component inward. So this Y would maybe step by 16. And then inside here, you would do a hot loop on Y from zero to 15. Um, and that allows you to work on more local data. However, my bottleneck is literally writing out the result. And I don't think there's anything I can do about that. Like, I am sequentially outputting the result, and I'm bottlenecking on that. Um, I don't think there's really anything I can do about this. I think this is as optimized as it can be. Let's see, I'm trying to think through that. Like I'm, I'm not bottlenecking on the performance, I'm bottlenecking on writing, and I'm already writing sequentially. So what, what could I possibly do there to improve performance? I don't think anything. So I think we might actually be done with this. And then we might move on to a, a fully connected layer implementation. Yeah, I can't imagine getting this any faster. We're bottlenecking on actually storing the outputs. So, uh, there's maybe a little bit of room for like 10%, but I don't think uh, we're gonna be able to double performance at all. So if we were to look at, let's say, uh, 18 by 18 input, so 16 by 16 output, how's that going to look? I think that's probably going to be in the 3500 range. And then we can see if it scales with threads, and I would suspect that it probably won't. Maybe it will. We'll see. Doop, 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 doop. Yeah, that doesn't seem like that's scaling. Might be a fluke. Run it again. Nope. So it looks like in this case, uh, four-way threading is a problem. What about two-way threading? Mm -hmm. Two-way threading seems to have a similar problem. So just 64 seems to be the way to go here. And we're just, we're bottlenecking on the streaming output. So at this point, what is this number? This is, uh, that was a fluke. We're at 3,500. What's going on? I think these like random jumps might be, huh? Okay, there's a 3500. I think this might be because I'm in cache mode on the Phi, and I might want to switch into um, MCD RAM, mo like into separate memory. So the high bandwidth memory is explicitly addressed by me. I think this might just be like having certain things not in the high bandwidth memory and then waiting for them to come in. I'm not quite sure. There shouldn't be this much noise between tests. Um, I would suspect that as some caching reason behind it. Um, so that's something we could try and set up now. There's a high bandwidth memory alloc, HB, mem, HB malloc, I think. Uh, I, let's see. MCD RAM. Uh, there's some library that allows you to do it. So we might switch into that mode. 
Where are we at here? Uh, that's, I don't know, I'm on the Wikipedia. Sorry. There's a, uh, this, memkind. Okay, so this is an implementation of, I think it's uh, jmalloc. And let's see if we can get Hopefully it's just something we can install. Damn. Okay. Uh, memkind. Extensible heap management built on jmalloc. Uh, last partitioning. So let's see. Oops. Uh, I'm guessing it's just build.sh. How did I not have auto account installed? Build J E Malik. Let's see, where's the build steps? Doop doop doop. So I don't know what the difference between the build J E Malik and the build R. So All right, uh, FAQ. It's available for Fedora. All right. Come on. Then we're also going to have to reboot this machine and change the mode in the BIOS. But I want to leave this as is because we know this is currently in a state uh, where um, equals uh, C target. Uh, the problem is Rust allocations aren't going to use that. That's okay. We're going to have to do some pretty hackery stuff. But, so yeah, this is definitely in a state where it's kind of random in terms of its performance. Well, I guess, we're, I mean, this, this is not a good time to benchmark when we're doing a bunch of compiles. Doop, 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 doop. All right. So if we look at these, we have, sometimes it's a thousand, thousand, 2,500, 2300, 3500. Okay. So then, uh, how do we use this? Uh, let's see. Did this install it? Hopefully, uh, where is it installing to? User local lib. I don't know if that's in our search path. Uh, yep, that's not. Libraries have installed to that. Blah, blah, blah. Shit. I want to install to user. Local. Wet. Ah. 
Yeah, that was that was a little ambitious. Shit. Hmm. Hopefully, you don't have to rebuild the whole thing just to change that. If it's static lib, yeah, I know I can use it. I just want like the man pages and stuff. Uh. Make J256, uh, studio make, install. <sighs> yeah, I feel like it didn't clean. Okay. So, memkind, high bandwidth nodes. Let's see, how do I actually check? Like, I'm curious, uh, what is it? Numa control? S, okay. Memory binds, I think it is an L, is it? Anyways, so we're going to, uh, I have another computer that IPMIs into this, which I'm gonna do, and sadly, you're not gonna be able to see it on stream, but uh, I'm basically gonna go through and reboot it. Um, so let's see, let's make sure that's up and running. Come on. Uh... Oh wait, is its IPMI not up? God damn it. All right, uh... Hmm, one second. So, uh, hopefully, we need to get IPMI view, uh, or, uh, one second here, I'm gonna try to get, um, uh, oops, proceed, one second, trying to find the Alright. Doop, doop, doop. Alright, here we go. Mm. Hmm. Okay. Hopefully not seeing any Lease is coming up, so IPMI is not coming up on that. Hopefully, I don't have to put in a actual monitor. I don't know if there's like a way to like force IPMI to go active or like reset IPMI, because like right now it's not showing up. Uh, actually, I might be able to do it from here. Hopefully I can get it to reset its link. Uh, let's see. And IPMI tool, DSP, figuring it. Uh, DHCP, okay, sudo IPMI tool land set one. Uh, LAN print one. Pseudo mod probe IPMI. Uh oh. Uh, dev intf. Okay. Huh. 
Okay. So, how do I get it to get a new IP? Sorry. I gotta remember to zoom in every once in a while. Ah, watch me do very basic, very basic IPMI. Shit. Get new lease. So I think, like, IP adder, auth, access, LAN. When configuring LANs, older versions will not automatically set in progress. Uh, unless I plugged into the wrong port. I don't think so. No, I think I did plug. Yeah. Ah, well, that makes a lot more sense. Okay. Sorry, that was stupid. Ah, shit. Uh. So, we can now launch this console if we have Java installed. What? Is it blocking a pop-up? Yes. Always allow. Launch. Okay. Show. Keep. Run. Java's going to complain because we got to change that. Configure Java. Uh, edit. Exceptions, HTTP, 192.168.1.109, add, continue, okay, now hopefully this will work, sorry, uh, later, okay, so now we have a console, so, so reboot, And I don't know if there's any way I can zoom in on this. I'm sorry. Uh, nope. That does not help. Sorry. I don't think there's any way I'm making this bigger. So, we're going to wait for that to come up. We're going to go into the BIOS. We're going to change the memory mode from... Uh, cache to like a different memory set, whatever it's called. Uh, ch -ch. Doop, 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 doop. Oh, shit, I missed it, didn't I? I was not paying attention. Oh, God. Oh, God. Reboot. Oh, there, yeah, I forgot there's a force enter BIOS. Whoops. I always forget that's the case, but it makes it a lot easier because it's just like, oh, go into the BIOS for me. <sighs> this is why I'm not a sysadmin. Come on. I don't know if you guys can hear that, but when it boots up, it sets all the fans to max speed, and it's quite loud. Come on. All right, what key? What key? Uh, set up. So, I forget where the, uh, 
memory configuration is uh, L1 prefetcher L2. That's weird. You can turn off the prefetchers. This is uh, SRAT. Okay. Power performance workload configuration. Frequency scaling. Uh, configurable TDP. We do have turbo, C states. So one thing we can do is we can turn off all of the, uh, let's see, performance optimizations, even at the expense. Yep, uncore frequency scaling to be programmed independently. P state, speed step, no. Okay, so disable, so we can't down core. C states, uh, we can disable those so we can't go to sleep. So hopefully if it's like a switching up to speed, that will go away. Then we have memory operating speed, auto, uh, SNC4, we want uh, sub node caching, memory mode is flat. Right, uh, flat cache hybrid. Yep. So flat means we'll get 16 gigs of like its own thing. Um, SNC four is the clustering mode, which is what we want. VTD, PCI, serial USB, acoustic. Uh, okay. Once again, we disabled those. So we should have disabled all of the like down coring things and we should now have a uh, separate memory. So I know on stream you probably couldn't see any of that. Um, sorry, I just couldn't make that scale up. So it's going to take a while for that to boot now. I'm going to use this as bathroom break time. I'll be back in a minute. All right, I'm back. Uh, still waiting for that to boot. It's got like a like a two or three minute boot time, just for the BIOS post after changing a configuration on the BIOS. It has to go through like a full reboot, which is pretty crazy. It's interesting because the more powerful computers get, the longer the boot times are. Like it's it's kind of silly, but whatever. That's how it is. So, um, don't know if we're, if, if this goes well, then hopefully we can switch directly over to, uh, writing some fully connected layer optimizations. But if this doesn't work out, we might spend more time trying to figure out how to make it go fast and end up never making it to fully connected layers. So it's not a, not a big deal if we don't get to a fully connected layer. That could be another stream at another time, maybe next weekend or uh, some random weekday as well. I also don't fully understand a lot of things of neural net networks yet. So uh, like back propagation, I don't fully understand the different ways to implement that, especially based on different, uh, sig like if you're using a sigmoid function versus you're using the RELU stuff. Um, so on and so forth. Come on, boot. So hopefully it detects like the high bandwidth 
Alec detects that we're, uh, uh, we've got memory. Okay, so this has detected that four, five, six, and seven are high bandwidth memory nodes, uh, which is true. So zero, one, two, three are the normal nodes for the actual system, uh, the normal RAM nodes for the system. So we should have some high bandwidth memory stuff now. And let's see, high bandwidth ALEC. So to do this, we're going to uh, copy the static lib. Let's see. We got an, do we get an SO or just an LA? What? Uh, auto HPW, Libman kind. What? I've never seen an LA, a lib tool. I mean, maybe I have. Huh. Do I pass in that LA file to the, the, the linker? I, I don't know. We'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. So we'll go into here, and then we'll grab source this. We're going to add an external dependency. Uh, and we're going to call it... What is this? I don't think we have any need to free memory, so we'll just do um, function hbw malloc, uh, and then we'll do size, which is a u size, and it outputs a constant, let's say a u8. And how do you do the extern? There's a way to specify the lib so it just automatically links with it. Uh, link this link name equals uh, lib kind or er, mem kind. I think this will fail because it won't be in our linker path. This will fail because I don't have the uh, rust flags dash c target. This might fail on link, we'll see. Or it might not fail because we don't use it. But we'll need to probably add that to our lib search path. So here we'll do print hp malloc and we'll print out the pointer that we get from an unsafe hpw malloc 4096 uh, as u size so I, I know we installed it but we, oh okay it just worked nice Looks like they're always running faster now, though. We're not using the high bandwidth memory, I don't think. Unless Linux has that built in. Uh, so it could have been some of the like uh, sleep, the like down coring. So it, maybe Linux was putting some of the CPUs to sleep, because now you can see they're always just going to run at max speed. They're never going to slow down. Um, so. Now we're not hitting 3,500. Interesting. Now I kind of want to go and change it to cache mode. So let's see if we can write a very quick uh, memory bandwidth detector for this. So let's perform an allocation. Alloc equals this. Then we are going to stream through this, right? 
uh, let alloc equals this, and then we're gonna make a uh, frost box slice. Uh, actually, rust box. From raw, take a mutable pointer to a thing. Uh, ch -ch -ch. Uh, I guess I don't need a box. So I will want to do function hb alloc, and this will return a static reference to a slice of U8s. Actually, we're doing everything on F32s, aren't we? Yep. So we're going to go and we're going to put that in F32s. Then we're going to do an allocation. Uh, the reason it's static is because it will never get freed. Uh, and it's... It's a static, static mutable reference. Size, use size. Then we're gonna do size times four because we're returning a slice of floats. And then we will do, uh, we will cast, oops. We will cast the output to a mutable uh, actually, this wants to be immutable as well. We will cast it into a mutable F32 pointer, and then we will do um, standard slice from raw parts mutable. So create a slice from a pointer of size sizes and elements because we're defining it as f32 and at this point that should be correct okay uh let's export uh. so now we have a way of getting a rust slice that is oops don't want that semi in fact this can be one line can it oh yeah so create an allocation we'll never free it so we don't need to worry about that uh foreign function is never used what oh because we never use this okay yeah so now we can do hb alloc 1024 will give us 1024 f32s and then we can print the length of this and it should be should of course be 30 uh, 1024 just sanity checking cool Okay, so now we can try and do a streamed read of bench mem. And we'll do here, we'll do let it equals rdtfc, and then uh, for blank in zero. How much do we want to read? So let's do alloc equals hb alloc. So allocate four gigs of memory, then uh, alloc.len. How do I want to write this? We might, I'm afraid this will get optimized out, so I'm just going to write it in assembly. Tile Intel syntax. Clobbers memory. Pass in the into a register alloc as pointer as u size. So pass in the pointer to that thing. That should be correct. Yep. Uh, and then here we'll do move eax move racks. Uh, 
Uh, we want to read this how much? That's how much we've allocated. We're going to read it 64 bytes at a time. One deck racks jump, not zero. Uh, one uh, behind. Move. V move. Double quadrant align 64. ZMM zero racks. Okay. So we do the allocation, then we get the IT, and then elapsed is geez, so we nice T print elapsed. Okay. Uh, and then we should probably call this. V move DQA sixty four of course DRF. Uh ooh yeah oof oof. Uh we want this to be one. Add or zero sixty four. So DRF that sixty four bytes at a time. DRF that decrement the count. So we can see it's uh, this many cycles. And if we switch to non-high bandwidth memory, so we were to make this just be uh, box new, uh, actually just box 0f32. Interesting. Huh, why is that not faster? I don't know, maybe I should unroll this a bit. So what what is this come out to? We'll do the math. Equals elapsed as F64 by. Okay, and then we do uh, M bytes is four times thousand twenty four. So we are actually we want G bytes. So that's how much we're actually reading. And we want to do G bytes divided by elapsed seconds. So Gigabytes per second, six. Maybe four isn't enough. Maybe I need to unroll. Yeah, that's definitely low. Minus 40 plus RX 80. All right, four times 64, yeah, 256. Why is that so slow? Oh, dependencies. There is a dependent, is, does the, is that a dependency? I don't know. Why is this so slow? All right. Uh, we can do the should have fast string operations. Uh, ooh, is it because we don't specify our clobbers? Racks zero one two three. Oops. Hmm. Here are clobbers. Paste comma. Racks 
zero and two, three. Same problem, okay. So we can change this to RDI is going to be, uh, RDI will get the Uh, RDI will get the pointer of the allocation. Then we can do move RCX is for that. Rep stos STOSB. Uh, da, 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 da. RDI. Pass in RDI. We're just going to write out bytes and move RCX. Invalid operand for instruction. What? I wonder if it wants to move Q. Oh, that's wrong. That's not Intel syntax, but whatever. Uh, store squad word. Hmm. Why is that so slow? What am I doing wrong here? Mm. Should I just loop this? Is that what's going on? Times the two dot oh. Oops, that crashed. Why did that crash? Uh, RDI gets clobbered, is that? Hmm. Doing something wrong here. I'm just trying to determine if it's actually using a high bandwidth memory or not. That's way too slow. Am I doing something stupid here? Is it TLB problems? Yeah, whatever. We'll just assume that it the HB alloc works. I, I'm not going to fiddle around with that too long. Okay, so in this case, we're going to go back up and we're going to change this to be a static F32. And this will now be uh, HB alloc. HB Alec and HB Alec. Uh, forty six, comma. And mutable. So now we'll be using the high bandwidth allocator. And we're getting about the same performance as before. Okay. So, yeah, I think uh, I think Linux might be using high bandwidth memory by default, which is cool if it does. So then that means we don't need the high bandwidth stuff. We'll stick with the box. We'll leave it like this. And we can get rid of this. 
and we'll get rid of uh, this. Okay, so 3,300 gigaflops, it looks like where we're going to peak out. And at this point, it's pretty reliable. Uh, we can up the number of iterations and get like a final benchmark here. Let's see, uh, more iterations. So it should be about a 14 second benchmark. Okay, cool. Didn't seem to be much of a difference between a longer run and a shorter run. And then we'll see if threading works in this case. Before it wasn't. So. The server's a lot louder. But yeah, that wasn't, wasn't as efficient. Okay. So ultimately it looks like the maximum speed we're going to get out of this is 3,300, 3,500 before. So I could put it maybe back in caching mode, uh, but we're at, oh, we're doing 18 by 18. What if we do, uh, if we go back to the like 130 by three. This one, I think, will this one fit in cache? Yeah, well, okay. Sweet. So, uh, I typically like to do 60, 64 by 64 for the inputs. So we'll look at, if we were to do 66 by 66 as the input, which would make the first convolutional layer be 64 by 64. Um, I might need to down the number of tests I don't know how much slower this is going to be. Um, and this one should definitely have caching issues. 66, or 64 times 64 times 4 times 16. So it's a 260k output. So that was pretty good. 2800 gigaflops. I don't think we're going to get really any better than that. So that's 38 million convolutions per second, which is quite good. Uh, so I didn't go back to this. We had this running this whole time. Um, I brought this up earlier. It's like showing as it like groups things in different areas. And we see that it's grouped uh, kind of the zeros in one area and the ones in this other area and the fours kind of up here and maybe threes and twos in this area. Um, these are the weights and things that it has come up with, but, uh, I think this has a benchmark somewhere. Uh, is it benchmark? So I know I have this stored locally and demo. Speed test. So where this is. All right. I don't know what this is going to tell. Oh, is it giving output to the console? I'm curious how it compares, but I don't think this is going to give uh, number here. So make CPU convoyer test. Hmm. No. Uh, or maybe it's gonna do ten. It's greater than ten. So what is the input? Oh, it's got a GPU convolution. Interesting. Start. So SX filters 96. So this is not a fair 
test. We're going to look at the local version so we can tweak these settings. Uh, and demo. And we're going to change the speed test to match the ones that we were doing because it's a little bit more fair in my opinion. So input uh, read only file. Uh -oh. Start an admin. Uh, okay, so uh, oops. Speed test. We're going to look at 64 by 64. Depth input is 3. 3. 64, 64. 1. Depth. Filters 16. Stride 1. Pad 0. So 66. Uh, size. Run example. So I think this should now. Okay. So that's doing a bunch of 64 by 64 by 1, 16 outputs, I think. And it's taking 5 milliseconds per. So effectively, this is going at 168 per second. So about we're, we're about, what is that? Uh, uh, we're a bit faster. No surprise there. Uh, 168 per second is surprisingly good for JavaScript. Yeah, we're about 225,000 times faster than this JavaScript implementation. And is it doing the GPU? It doesn't say in this one. Anyways, whatever. So... JavaScript's slow, we know that, nothing new. Nothing is new. Um, anyway, so, what do we wanna do? Uh, actually, we haven't done a validation for a while. Let's make sure we haven't broken something. We didn't like comment out the rights or something. No, this should pass all the tests. Nice. Okay, we didn't break it. Cool. Um. So yeah, I don't, I think I'm going to do the fully connected layer as another stream, because at this point I'm kind of a little bit hungry, um, and I'll pick up where we kind of left off at another point, or I'll probably actually learn more about all the different layers uh, so that I come a little bit more prepared, or I might do a similar thing where I'll have like an implementation and we'll go through and optimize it, or I'll just write a fully connected implementation, because it'll be very similar to this video. Like, the optimization steps will be identical. Um, and then maybe we'll build a network instead in the next video. So thank you, everyone, for showing up. And I will try to have this uploaded to YouTube, uh, hopefully within uh, a couple hours. Thanks for watching.